really um, the purpose of them from the beginning has just been to educate doctors about how to manage COVID on the ground. Um, I've had a few questions about CPD points. And I mean, if we carry on with a, with a stream of webinars for GPs and not necessarily just COVID, um, we certainly are going to have them CPD accredited. But at the moment, at the beginning, we just, we didn't want sponsors, CPDs or any other, anything other than just um, re reaching out and supporting one another. Um, our first webinar, which was about 12 weeks ago, I think now, was um, attended by about 100 doctors. And we had um, Dr. Richard Friedland from for the CEO of Netcare who joins us again tonight. I'll introduce the panel soon. Um, and, and that really was just to help GPs in the midst of the crisis to know, you know, with him and the clinicians who joined us, how to, how to manage COVID. We've been grateful to be able to explore um, all the different aspects of COVID or, or that are relevant to us. And it's wonderful to be able to come together again tonight and um, look at this topic again, but tonight maybe from a very different standpoint. So I'll just give it another minute. To... And while we that, I'll, I'll just maybe put sure all the tech is fine. So um, I'll, I'll start with our technical man of the moment always, who's Dan Stillerman. Um, Dan has really been very helpful to us from the beginning. So Dan, I can I take it you can hear me. And indeed, yeah, we lost okay. you for a couple of seconds, but you're back, so welcome back. Thank you. Okay, so so Dan Stillerman runs a company that he started called the Excel Academy. Um, Dan's an actuary, and like all good actuaries who are creative, he's gone and branched out into new things, and he's become a real Zoom wizard and he's really helped our ggpc with all of the different you know zoom webinars and meetings we've done we've decided to do tonight as a webinar on, you know dan has as well because it just gives us more opportunity to host more people not have 40 screens of 25 doctors on in the screen we can run a q a um so perhaps i can ask dan to tell us a bit about the tech do you want, do you want to go through a bit of the technical stuff dan just before we start just yeah, thanks, Doc. Q and A in the chat. Yeah, thanks, and welcome to everybody. So it's it's not too difficult. I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with Zoom by now. Uh, but basically, there is a chat and there's a Q and A. And as uh, Daniel mentioned, we may turn the chat off at certain points during the evening. Uh, but the Q and A is open throughout. So if you do have specific questions, either in general or for specific presenters or panelists, please post them into the Q and A section. You can click the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. There's actually a feature now which is quite useful that you can see everyone else's questions and you can comment on and you can upvote certain questions which is quite useful uh, because when there's dozens of questions it becomes quite difficult to go through them and cluster them together so rather you can just find the questions that you uh, would like to be posed to the panel uh, and just click on the like button and that will shift it to the top of the list and yeah I think that's that's all from me for now. Okay great so um, we will just, just the broad outline of the webinar tonight is we'll spend the first part of the webinar doing look, looking at the pandemic. Um, we, I'll introduce our panel now. So we, we're very blessed again to have Dr. Richard Friedland join us, who's the CEO of Netcare. He's got a team of epidemiologists who, who have tracked this virus throughout um, since it you know, came on our shores. And he's as those of you have seen, spoke, heard him speak before, particularly on our first webinar, um, it's very interesting to see the trends and the, the, the changes that are happening in our country. And I've asked him to come on again because, you know, he spoke to us right at the beginning as we were going up the curve. And I want, we want to see tonight how, how where we are compares. Um, after that, we will have Professor Barry Shub, who um, is a virologist and founded the NRCD. We've had the NRCD on our second webinar speak to us and he, he actually started the NRCD. He's been retired and come hugely back into um, public life with, with uh, COVID-19, also making a big difference. And he's going to talk to us about some very pertinent issues that we, the doctors have been asking about. Um, tonight, 
webinar is really focused on doctor wellness. Um, the, the, the first two speakers speak about COVID and how, how it affects us you know, physically, but um, we're blessed tonight to have Mr. Lee De Silva, who is the MD of HealthBridge. HealthBridge, um, not, not, not a stranger company to most of you, um, re very responsible for a large amount of claims in the, in the private sector, um, a company that's very in touch with promoting good doctor practice and um, really tracking you know, what's happening in terms of um, claims and in terms of not, not just claims, but you know, e-medicine and, and, and really just like working on technology in terms of the, the medicine space. Louis will talk to us about the trends that we're seeing in, in, in with COVID-19. And his topic is how to inoculate your practice against COVID-19, something that I feel we all need at this point. And then for the second part of the webinar, and that's the personal part, and this is where I really reach out to all the people on here. And at the moment, for most of you, it's just numbers from participants on, but we're able to spotlight anyone who wants to talk. Um, we've got a few doctors who have come forward and are prepared to tell their story about how they got COVID-19 and how it affected their lives. And um, we're blessed to have Peter Klein Fagan and David Abramson, who are both two very accomplished mental health professionals who have so much empathy and so much understanding and they've given so many people guidance, um, both, both healthcare professionals and also um, you know, just people in the public, and many of you know them, and they will facilitate that talk. So really looking forward to it. And before we waste any more time, um, let me hand over to Richard and ask Richard if he would share with us where we're at at the moment. Yeah, thank you so much, David. Um, <clears throat> Daniel. And uh, to all of our esteemed panelists, it's a great pleasure to be with you once again. You know, I remember talking to you on the 2nd of July, Thursday, the 2nd of July, when um, we were in a very different place in South Africa. And uh, we were beginning to see a massive surge in the Gauteng. We hadn't really seen a surge in KwaZulu-Natal. And we had kind of witnessed what was happening in the Western Cape. And many of us were really concerned was how we're going to get deal with this pandemic. Um, how are we, would we have enough hospital beds? Would we have enough oxygen? Would our doctors uh, be completely burnt out and fatigued? And would we have enough PPE and enough nurses? And I think when you look back at what we've been through over the last, well, it's actually been uh, 164 days since lockdown. Uh, South Africa has done remarkably well compared to many developed countries. And I think part of that has been the fact that we've come late into the pandemic and we've been able to benefit from some of the treatment protocols, but I think largely due to the amount of preparation that went in. And uh, I want to say a huge shout out to all of our colleagues out there, all of our GP colleagues and allied health professionals who played such an important role during this pandemic. No one's declaring victory at the moment. There's no doubt about that. And uh, we're not going to do what some so-called developed countries have done. There's still a long road ahead. But I do think we're over the worst, as I'll show you in terms of the numbers. But I think, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, take a bow. Um, we've dealt with something that's unprecedented in, in global history. And I think South African healthcare workers right across the board have done extremely well. And of course, we've had tragedies and we've had several hundred healthcare workers die in the line of duty. And, and tonight, I want to pay tribute and homage to them. Um, this is not a long presentation because the numbers all point in the same direction as you would imagine. And so I'm going to just spend the next five minutes literally taking you through 10 or 11 slides. So let's take a look at what's happened. Um, can you all see that screen? Yep. Great. I'm afraid I can't get onto the next slide. Oh, there we go. So the basic message is that active cases have continued to decline in South Africa. Uh, for the last number of weeks. And what do we mean by active cases? Is those cases within the first 14 days of infection that can potentially be uh, infectious. And if after 14 days, 
uh, you are not re-hospitalized or you haven't unfortunately passed away, you're considered to be recovered. And so you can see here, the bottom of the screen, we've had over 638,000 cases in South Africa. Um, new cases as of last night was 1,600. But pleasingly, and the most important aspect is that the vast majority, some 91% of cases have recovered from this illness. We have unfortunately had close on 15,000 deaths and only 9% of the cases are in the active case. And I'm gonna take you back to that date in the 2nd of July in later slides to show you where we were, where the vast majority of cases were in fact active. And here you can see it's really only in the Free State and the Northwest uh, and the Northern Cape where you've still got reasonably high cases of act active cases because they've been late in surging. And you can see the number of new cases per day really now well below a thousand in most of the provinces, a stark difference to what we saw uh, when we began speaking. And so we always look at a trend over seven days because one day doesn't tell you much. And you can see a very important statistic here. Um, the total number of confirmed cases has only increased by 2% over the last seven days, which is a very small amount. And active cases have declined by some 18%, which is extraordinary. I'm gonna show you a graph later on the doubling time. And you can see now in South Africa, the doubling time has moved out in the last week from 46 to 53. When we were speaking on the 2nd of July, cases in South Africa were doubling every 14 days. Every two weeks, the total number of cases was doubling. And obviously as the denominator, the number of cases increase, that slows. But this really shows that we are now uh, in recovery across South Africa. Now, another very important uh, aspect to look at is the number of tests that return positive. And this has decreased since the 18th of July. So take a look here on the left-hand side. When we started speaking in early July, approximately over there, about 15%, one in six South Africans were testing positive, and it went as high as 28.5% during the peak of this pandemic. In other words, close on one in, well, more than one in four, close on one in three South Africans were, who were going for tests were testing positive, and that's decreased to about 10%. And the World Health Organization says you achieve stability when this number approximates between three to five and certainly below 10%. Of course, the number of people being tested has also declined. And you can see the number of tests peaked at about 41,000 here in July, and has really come off to about less than half of that. Um, and um, you can see the number of cases has commensurately uh, dropped because now it's only one in 10 South Africans are testing positive um, for the virus. Look at the average daily cases per week. That's also come off. We reached an absolute peak in South Africa or in Gauteng of 5,100 cases um, in July. You can see the peak uh, in KwaZulu-Natal here in the blue, which overtook the Western Cape as the most populous province. Originally, it was the Western Cape, which looks a bit like Table Mountain, went through a six to eight week decline. But KwaZulu-Natal then took over in terms of the number of cases coming through. And then you can see now uh, what happened in the Eastern Cape as well. And so these are still the active cases um, per province, but again, declining very, very significantly. The key question we've got to ask ourselves is uh, what will that number decline to? And I'm going to show that to you across the various provinces, because we're always going to have background COVID. COVID doesn't disappear until we have herd immunity and or a vaccine. And I'm sure Professor Shub is going to speak to that in some detail. So the question is, is what is that background amount of COVID when we stabilize? And we're starting to see a stabilization. We haven't seen it yet. Now, the most important thing to do is to try to predict where active cases are going. And so we look at a moving average over the last 14 days. And this thick line shows you the moving average. And the dotted line actually shows you the actual cases. Now, what's interesting is the moving, the thick line is what we is a lag indicator. It's accumulation of the average over all of these periods. 
whereas the dotted line is the actual, it's a lead indicator. And what you can see in South Africa is that the cases are actually lower than the moving average. And so it tells you that cases are coming down. And this is what's happening right across South Africa. And all of these moving averages will follow the lead indicator down. And you can see there were stages where the lead indicator was higher, we were still peaking, but now these are very positive trends that show us that the lead indicator is pulling that active number of active cases down. You can see again that the number of cases is reducing per province quite significantly. Uh, and this is the per million in the province and they're all showing the same direction. Again, the Northern Cape is slightly higher because they are the late, the last to come through the surge and particularly in the um, uh, Kimberley area and district around Kimberley. Um, but we feel that that will come down in the next two weeks or so. But the rest of the country, including the Free State, should follow this trend very, very nicely. And again, as I mentioned, uh, the doubling time, this is a very good indication. You can see that Gauteng is now at 15, uh, 55 days, South Africa is at 53, KwaZulu-Natal is at 44, KwaZulu-Natal peaked after the Gauteng, we first saw Western Cape, then Gauteng, then um, KwaZulu-Natal, and the Western Cape now at 75 days. At one stage, KwaZulu-Natal was doubling at every nine days. So you can see again this trajectory of recovery. Now, one of the most important measures, and I'm sure that Professor Shub will speak to you about this, is the um, reproduction rate of the virus, what we call the RT or reproduction number. And this is effectively how many people will one person infect. And it's very dependent on the infectious period of the virus. And in our model, uh, we've used seven days. And if the RT is less than one, the virus will ultimately die out over time. If it's greater than one, which it's been for most of the pandemic, there will be a significant outbreak and continued spread. And if the RT is equal to one, it means the infection will remain stable. In other words, for every person there, one person who gets it, another person will be infected. Let's have a look at South Africa. And I'll end with this slide. This is my last slide. So you can see that uh, the real change occurred in South Africa and um, you can see it here in the gray towards the end of July and early August. Um, the um, Gauteng also started falling and the RT currently at the moment is 0.88. Now there are different estimates, there are different websites and actuarial um, models that are predicting this to be even lower. We model this on a daily basis, but this is indicating, and since it's remained at this level for quite a while, uh, that we are entering a recovery phase. That's not to say we won't get a second wave. We're of the opinion in Netcare that there will be a second wave. It's almost um, inevitable given what's happened in other countries. I think we're going to be a lot smarter, a lot more rational about how we deal with it and treat it. And obviously all the precautionary measures are absolutely critical at the moment. But I hope that the slides I'm showing you are a far cry from where we all were in quite an anxious and fearful time at the beginning of July to where we are now. And uh, a lot in part due to your extraordinary um, efforts. I'm going to end there, Daniel, and hand over back to you. Thank you so much, Richard. I, I must say it's very encouraging to see that RT number less than one. I, I wouldn't have predicted when we spoke in early July that we would have been able to meet tonight and say that same thing. And I'm hoping that when we meet sometime in the future, uh, maybe about something not COVID-19, we'll be able to look at the stats as I no doubt you'll still be doing them again and we'll be able to have the RT number then and it'll be even less than 0.2 or something. But thank you very much. And thank you for coming you. on at this late stage. I really, we really appreciate and, and, it. And Daniel, a great credit to you for this webinar and the education and the insights that we've been able to share with all of us. I think it's been extraordinary. I, I've had the privilege of attending uh, a few of them and I think you've done an extraordinary job. And to all of your colleagues out there and to uh, my colleagues, Congratulations to you. I think you've done extremely well. I'm afraid I've got to sign off. I'd like you just to call me when our psychologists come back on our district 
desperate need of their therapy. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to move on now and not, not waste much time in between the, the chats. Um, so we, we, with those encouraging stats, we're very privileged tonight to have um, Prof. Barry Shub with us. Um, Prof. Barry Shub is a specialist microbiologist. He's got two doctorate degrees in medicine and science. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Pathology. He, he, as I said, he's a prof of virology and he founded the NRCD, which is really the, 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 the main uh, mouthpiece for, for outbreaks like this across the country. So something he can be very proud of. Um, he was its executive director between 2002 and 2011 and he retired. And I, I think the whole country realized very much that he was a voice that was really needed during COVID-19. He's certainly been very involved in community endeavors um, and guidance in terms of COVID-19, but still continues to you know, work at full steam, even though he's meant to be retired. And mm -hmm. we're very privileged to have him. So over to you, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Daniel, uh, for that introduction. It's really, for me, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor. I just want to echo what Richard said in, um, in uh, my admiration for you for kind of putting this program together. It's been extremely valuable. I've also listened to one or two of them as well. And uh, I've learned a lot. I've learned a, a great deal. Um, and I, I, let me just start to my screen. Yeah, what I'm going to do with this slide is really pay homage to the general, uh, general practitioner fraternity as a whole, because um, you guys really are the cold face. You, you, you face the challenges, you face the difficult uh, scenarios. Us in the specialist uh, part of the medical profession have it very, very much easier, uh, and myself very, very much easier, because for us it's just yes or no. You kind of face these challenges, you see these, these odds, clinical syndromes and you've really got to take it from there. So it's really an admiration and, uh, and again, I really must um, pay homage to all the general practitioners. I think yours really is the most important part of the medical profession. And I'm saying that because I've been in the medical profession for over 50 years. And for 50 years, I've recognized how valuable general practitioners are. All right, let me start right. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, let me just go one back, uh, is in this talk, talk about three aspects, uh, which I get really the most questions fired at me. One of them is the modes of transmission, and this has advanced uh, in, most, in most recent uh, weeks and maybe even one a month or two. Uh, also talk about immunity, personal immunity and second infections, and then uh, population immunity or herd immunity and second waves. And then just one or two words about the future, maybe to try and end on a, a fairly bright note. So first of all, with regard to modes of transmission. Now, the classical picture of modes of transmission of COVID virus really followed from a, a seminal paper in 1910, way back in 1910, by a guy called Charles. And that the, actually is not an L that's missing here. That's not a spelling mistake. His name was Chapin, Charles Chapin. And Charles Chapin kind of looked at other respiratory viruses. And what he did was kind of model all respiratory viruses to be transmitted along a certain kind of route. And what he says that the main way in which respiratory viruses are spread, and I think we know this obvious logical, is by the airborne route. But what he said was that airborne route you can divide into two in terms of respiratory transmission, that there are droplets that the respiratory particles coming from person that's infected can be divided into droplets, which are larger particles, particles from five micron, remember microns are a thousandth of a millimeter, so we're talking about microscopic particles, five microns and upwards. And those particles are relatively heavy, even though they're microscopic, that they don't remain suspended in the air for very long, and they drop down onto a surface. When they're on a surface, you can touch them with your hands, uh, over there, it's surface to touch your hands. Your hands, of course, are the vectors of anything which is dirty. And then touching mucous membranes of the mouth, nose, and eyes, that's how you could inoculate them. That was the kind of main kind of dogma, the main paradigm of how respiratory infections were transmitted. Then we get to aerosols. Now, aerosols are much finer particles. 
less than five microns in diameter, much smaller, much lighter, and therefore they remain suspended in the air probably for, for hours, in fact, whereas droplets will only remain suspended in the air for a matter of maybe uh, minutes or maybe even seconds. So aerosols can be suspended for a much longer period of time. But what Charles Chapin said and what, what the dogma, even in the early days of coronavirus, up to fairly recently, was that aerosols were only opportunistically involved, only, for example, in a healthcare center with bronchoscopy or intubation or those kind of procedures. But in the normal household transmission, the normal kind of public transmission, public and inverted commerce uh, of coronavirus, they didn't play any significant role. And the surfaces would play a role. And of course, hand transmission of the virus would play a role. And of course, there was quite a bit of uh, proof for this. Uh, it is a respiratory virus, uh, sorry. It is a respiratory virus, uh, and therefore it should follow, for example, influenza and other respiratory viruses, mainly droplet spread. Also, you know that from close contact, that close contact is the major role of transmission. Uh, the closer you are, uh, and up to about, we say, six feet or two meters. Uh, that is where transmission would take place and not beyond that. Also looking at the relative efficacy for household transmission, we're not talking about healthcare centers, but out, outside the healthcare center, that surgical masks would really play a, probably a, an equivalent role in high particle filters such as N95 masks. Household transmission studies, again, corroborated the Charles Chapin model. And if you look at the basic reproductive number of 2.5, again, it follows respiratory infections. Unlike, for example, aerosol spread, which we see in measles and chickenpox. Now, measles has a, a basic reproductive number of anything from 12 to 18, and chickenpox very similar to about 12. And again, the secondary, trans, uh, secondary attack rate of, uh, again, falls into respiratory viruses. So you look at all these factors, and it seems to confirm what Charles Chapin said all the way back in 1910. However, and yeah, I must uh, also pay tribute to the technical working group of the Minister's Advisory Council on Airborne Transmission. Uh, I was uh, very lucky to be part of this. I must also thank uh, Professor Lucille Bloomberg. I'm not sure if she's on, on the webinar, but she chaired this meeting. And I learned a lot from this technical working group. Because what they said, when I say they, it's really the physicists who, st who study aerosols and droplet transmission. They looked at various other things. They looked at, for example, super spreading events. You know what we have, for example, uh, in the bus transmission in China, uh, the houses of worship, the choir practice in Washington. Also distance spreading events. We know that there have been some cases where individuals walking past a corridor where there's a patient who's got COVID and they've picked it up. So distant transmission again would also tend to suggest there's something more than droplets and that aerosols do play a role as well. Also pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic spread of infection we know is also an important aspect of COVID transmission. Again, pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, you don't have people coughing and so on, but also suggest that aerosols do play a role. Now, why am I harping on this aerosol issue? Because aerosols, unlike droplets, aerosols can be projected well beyond six feet. Because they're much lighter, they can go well beyond that. Being lighter, they can persist in the air for, in fact, hours at a time. Again, important, uh, particularly in the healthcare setting, if somebody is infected, that there's droplets, uh, the aerosols, so the aerosols can remain for quite a period of time. And also, the small aerosols can penetrate deep into the distal parts of the airways, into the lungs. They can bypass the upper respiratory tract and get into the lungs. Now, we don't know if that does play a role in the pathogenesis of severe infection, but it may well do, because again, your virus is getting right into, for example, causing pneumonia, and also the vascular problems and so on. Now, I must also thank my colleague, Professor Robin Wood of, you know, of, um, of Cape Town University. He's done a lot of studies uh, on aerosol transmission. And what he's shown, there's a complicated graph, but really what I want to point out is that you can see particles, respiratory particles of all sizes 
uh, from large size greater than five microns to a fraction of a micron are emitted in all kinds of situations. In coughing, these are different color codes for these different particle sizes. Uh, in the force vital capacity uh, procedure, tidal breathing, coughing, and so on. So all particles, including aerosols, seem to be a factor in all kinds of respiratory expiratory events. This is quite an important slide, which I just wanted to show you. It's actually, it's a quite an old publication. Uh, it came out in about, I think, March or April. And it's a study after the New York that, that well-documented um, very severe epidemic in New York City. And when I look, if you just concentrate on this upper panel over here, when I started with, uh, with procedures, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, the social distancing didn't seem to make much difference in terms of the daily new confirmed cases. Stay at home regulations, not too much. But when they enforced face covering, masks, you can see how the incidence of new cases dropped quite considerably. Again, emphasizing the critical, crucial role of masks in preventing virus transmission. So these are a couple of the take home things. The important thing to remember is that in all of us, there's this moist, warm cloud of respiratory particles while I'm talking uh, or even just breathing that face masks are critical to prevent the transmission of infection from that moist warm cloud of an individual that's infected to a susceptible individual. Physical distance can be measured by the cube, by the cube um, multi uh, multi multiplying factor in terms of distance, in terms of dilution. In other words, the, the more you dilute, it's by a factor of cube, it's actually, the, the more you distance from a source of infection, it's diluted by, so in other words, beyond six feet, your, your dilution factors in several tens of thousands. And that's why distance plays a major role. Congregate crowding of individuals. If you reduce congregate crowding by 75%, you reduce transmission by 50%. Reduce crowding by 50%, you can reduce transmission rate by 25%. And then also the various kinds of expiratory events, breathing, talking, and more so shouting and singing. And you can, Put this all together in this graph over here. Some of you may have seen this graph, it's with, from JAMA again, about April, quite a time ago. And you can see, you can classify the risk of transmission by first of all, wearing a face mask, not wearing a face mask, outdoors well ventilated, indoors well ventilated, poorly ventilated, low occupancy in terms of crowdedness and high occupancy. And you can see how the red kind of uh, as, you as you sum all these factors up, how it increases your, your rate of transmission. A few words about immunity. I'm not going to go into all of this because uh, I think Daniel will kind of pull the trap door. I mean, I'll have to disappear. So I'm just going to go through it very, very briefly. Innate immunity, of course, plays a role um, in all infectious diseases. Acquired immune response, the antibody response I'll talk about just now. Uh, the cell-mediated immune response also play an important role in protection against viral infections, pre-cytotoxic T cells. The trained immune response is thought to play a role. What we mean by trained immune response is the non-specific response to other vaccines. And that's where maybe BCG may play a role. Other vaccines such as oral polio vaccine may have a non-specific protective effect by training the immune system to protect against coronavirus. This regulated immune response or immune mediated uh, disease, the cytokine storm in the latter part of complicated infections also play a role. Uh, second infections, the Hong Kong man, again, unfortunately I won't have time, but maybe in question time, we can deal with this in a bit more detail. What I do wanna talk about is antibody testing. Now, cause I get a lot of questions about this. Also a lot of questions from general practitioners about antibody testing. When not, let me start, when not to do antibody testing. Antibody testing do not play a role in diagnostics. They do not diagnose infection. I'll show you just now why not. Also antibody testing in terms of population, uh, serious surveillance is of very little use in low prevalence populations. Even if you take a specificity of the antibody test as 99%, if you're looking at a 1%, let's take an extreme, 
1% prevalence in the population, you've got just as much chance of a false positive as a false negative. Your, your uh, positive predictive value is about 50%. So a low prevalence population, there's little point in doing seroprevalence with antibody testing. Why does antibody testing not play a role in diagnosis? I'm sure you've seen this, this is such a well-known, well-cited diagraphic. This is the antibody response in the dotted curve of the air. The purple is the IgM, the green is the IgG. And you see it only starts coming positive and probably really reaches detectable level probably about at least 10 days into the, uh, into the disease. So it's really not of that much use in terms of diagnosing. It may be of some use if you want to see somebody has been infected in the past, but not to diagnose an infection. To diagnose an infection, you have to demonstrate the virus, either the antigen or else the nucleic acid via PCR test. The problems, there are a lot of problems today in September 2020 with antibody response testing. For example, if you look at these figures in Iceland, they showed, and this is a, a, a very large study of the Icelandic population, uh, and these are planned, strategically planned population studies. They found that the durability of antibody responses is very high. They looked at individuals four months post-infection and 91% of them still had antibodies. On the other hand, in California, they showed the complete opposite. They showed a rapid decay, that the half-life of antibodies was only 73 days, the half-life. So the majority of people by four months certainly had no antibodies at all. So what do we make of this? At this stage, in September 2020, antibody response is not going to tell us an awful lot how durable um, the, the immunity in terms of neutralizing antibodies are after an infection. If you look at population seroprevalence studies, again, we're having conflicting information. In Spain, they did a very extensive study, 61,000 participants in a very well-structured household study. And they found that the prevalence overall in the country was about 5%. It varies uh, less than 3% in the countryside to 10% in Madrid, but overall about 5%. In New York City, after their big epidemic, they looked at healthcare personnel and their seroprevalence was between 6% for those who are very meticulous with mask wearing, to 9% those who weren't so meticulous in mask wearing. On the other hand, here in South Africa, the UCT have just concluded a seroprevalence study on convenience samples, antenatal samples and HIV clinical samples, and they found the opposite. They found between 37 and 40% seroprevalence in that population. All right, so much for individual, a couple of, uh, brief points about population immunity or herd immunity. And this all revolves around, as Richard said earlier, this magic basic reproductive number or R0. Now the R0, the basic reproductive number of a coronavirus is about 2.5. One person, infected person, will infect two and a half people who are susceptible. The effective reproductive number, RTT stands for the time factor, um, is how we intervene. If we stop that virus by mask, by physical distance, et cetera, et cetera, we can lower that reproductive number. And if we lower it below one, then the virus doesn't have susceptible host to infect, and therefore the infection will start declining. The virus doesn't disappear. The virus is still there. Just the epidemic comes down. The only virus where the only virus, human virus, that we've managed to completely eradicate is smallpox. No other virus will completely disappear. We're near there with, with polio, not there quite yet. However, in a super spreading event, if we give that virus ample place, crowding, indoors, poor ventilation, that R factor can go up to four or five. So what we need to do if we don't have a vaccine is we have to rely on these non-pharmaceutical interventions to lower that R factor, to bring the epidemic down. Now you can actually calculate what percentage of the population needs to be immune for the virus to start coming down. And it's one minus one over R. Now if R is 2.5, you need 60% of the population to be immune. You can do the calculation very easily. So what we need to do is make that R lower and lower and lower 
to get herd immunity well below 60% for the epidemic to come down. Spikes and second waves, just to, uh, to uh, clarify the terminology, this is the Spanish influenza of 1918-19, which had waves. What we mean by a wave is where the epidemic comes down to almost normal, never to totally normal, but uh, or never totally disappear, but coming down and then it goes back up again. And this is a typical first wave, oh, crumbs. first wave, second wave, third wave. What we mean by what we mean by resurgence is a seasonal influenza. The epidemic comes down and then resurges back up again. And these are spikes in the curve. So that's a second wave, a resurgence, and a spike. I won't go through this. Uh, just uh, how do we do surveillance for second waves? Well, we can do it by serious surveillance. Uh, and this has to be a dynamic serious surveillance. What we want to see is the movement of antibody responses in the human population. As it starts coming up, then it's an indicator, an early warning size, sign that there is an impending second wave. But what's very useful, in fact, is looking at the virus itself either by random or focused testing of individuals who have clinical symptoms, or by wastewater or sewage sampling. Now we know the virus is excreted in the stool and it's found in sewage. And sewage epidemiology or wastewater epidemiology is well documented for things like, for example, poliovirus and other enteroviruses. We just need to plug in that with covirus, with, with coronavirus. And that'll give us an early warning signal that there is a viral mass in the population threatening a second wave. So just to, to round off a couple of peaks into what we can expect into the future. Obviously, we all hope for a vaccine. And what the vaccine, the place of a vaccine in terms of, because at this stage, we don't know how effective the vaccine is. We don't know is it one or two doses. We don't know how durable that immunity is going to last. But what we really want to look at in terms of a vaccine is to reduce that R figure, to supplement the non-pharmaceutical interventions. And remember, we can't dispense with the non-pharmaceutical interventions. But what we want to add to that is with, with artificial immunity by a vaccine. So vaccine that now artificial immunity plus natural immunity of people that have been infected plus non-pharmaceutical interventions, we want to try and get to that that's herd immunity level, so that the epidemic comes down. So that's the one scenario that the vaccines will come and probably sometime next year, the middle to the latter part of next year, we'll have available vaccines for at least a, sex, a, a good section of the population. Now, what about virus attenuation? What about the virus itself? Now, we know that viruses generally do evolve and viruses will evolve in two ways. It's in the virus's interest to be transmissible, to be infectious, and it's in the virus interest not to cause severe disease. Viruses tend to reduce their virulence and increase their transmissibility. Now, the, the original coronaviruses uh, of 2003 and the MERS virus of 2012, they had high mortalities, but poor transmissibility, and they were well controlled. The present SARS-CoV virus has got a much lower mortality, much less severe disease, much more infectious. Now, historically, Spanish influenza was, of course, the mother of all pandemics, more than 50 million people. That was killed. That is when H1N1 came into the human population. H1N1, of course, is now a relatively tame influenza virus, one of our seasonal influenza viruses. And very soon after the Spanish influenza uh, pandemic, it became a fairly mild infection. It's attenuated, became weaker. And if you look at the current outbreak of coronavirus, again, we're seeing a weaker virus. South Africa, as Richard said, we have a lower mortality. Part of it is better treatment. Part of it, of course, is the age distribution. But part of it may also be that the virus has become a little bit weaker. And we're actually seeing it in the second waves in Europe, that the mortality, et cetera, is also dropping, is dropping. And genetically, we're seeing that the D614 gene, I mean, as you all know, D is a spartine and uh, G is glycine, you all know about that. Uh, this mutation actually phenotypically 
is lower transmissibility and uh, sorry, increased transmissibility and lower virulence. The same with the Delta 302 uh, deletion. Both of these in the open reading frame of the, of the virus, which regulates its, its, uh, its transmissibility. So this is, this is my final slide, Daniel, don't worry, my final slide. Um, just how to put it into perspective. As you know, we've got four entrenched human coronaviruses. This, as you may remember from your virology of third year, was about 45 seconds of lecturing time. We didn't devote too much time. These four viruses cause mild upper respiratory infection, the common cold, and occasionally mild gastroenteritis. We weren't kind of too worried about these. These are entrenched since antiquity human, uh, human coronaviruses. The more recent viruses coming from, which are really zoonotic viruses, are the SARS viruses. SARS CoV-1, uh, MERS of 2003, MERS of 2012, and now 2019 SARS-CoV-2, causing severe respiratory systemic infection or COVID-19. And what I think is going to happen over the time is that this particular virus is now going to eventually become one of our entrenched human viruses. And in fact, these viruses might have started off as SARS and then adapted to human beings. This, of course, is going to take quite a while, but there are at least some kind of light that the virus is starting to attenuate. So I think more importantly is our non pharmaceutical interventions, vaccine eventually, and eventually, eventually virus attenuation. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, a lot of interesting information there. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna have quite a bit of, quite a few questions there. Um, certainly around the, the, R, the R number, RT number, um, our reduction of it, um, transmission. I, I, certainly, have, we've had a few questions about how, how much transmission is relevant in terms of surfaces. But I, th I think what we should do is maybe just wait on the questions for a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll take, we'll let Louis talk. And then maybe just before we start talking about doctor's stories, we'll just take a few questions. So um, if you look in the Q&A, um, th that is the place where you can ask questions. And what, what, certainly what's happened on other talks is we often have a lot of questions and we aren't able to get through them. So if you, even if you go into the Q&A and look at some of the questions that have been um, asked, if you, if you resonate with them, please upvote them. I'm just giving them a tick up. And um, if you do have a question, just say who it's for. And I will try and spend a few minutes at some point just you know, trying to ask some questions to Prof Shub and to Louis de Silva. So thank you, Prof. That was very enlightening. I'm going to swap to, to um, Louis for, for a bit, and then we'll come back to the questions. So just to introduce Louis, Louis is the MD of HealthBridge. Um, HealthBridge is, as I said at the beginning, a company that's not uh, strange uh, to, to anyone. Um, it's um, a company that has GP a lot of us are, uh, are involved with. Um, he, he's not really speaking tonight in, as, as the capacity of HealthBridge. He's speaking really just broadly in terms of the excellent data analyst and, and really just person who's very in touch with the industry and what's happening in the industry, who he is. Um, a bit of his background, he's actually an electrical engineer. He did a BSc in electrical engineering, which he passed with the distinction. Um, he got the top, top marks, well, most distinguished stu students in his year. He then went on to do an MBA, like all good engineers do at WITS, and he became um, the MD of HealthBridge. And um, he, he really has led, led the sector um, as being a, really the leader of a company that plays such a vital role for all of us in terms of our practices as bridging between us as, in, as professionals, um, the, the medical aid funders, um, and, and just like a really innovative co company that looks at developing healthcare in the digital space and in and and in, in terms of future um, developments in our practices. Um, he's got a lot to share in terms of what Healthbridge has seen over this time in COVID nineteen, and it's really great to have him with us. So, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, best I bring my A game after introduction like that. And certainly to you and your colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to present amongst these uh, other esteemed uh, presenters today. Uh, let me uh, get my screen sharing. Um, 
Daniel, has it has it coming through? Do we see a, an orange screen yeah. there? Hundred percent. Good. Okay. So my title today, we've spoken rightly so a lot about the impact of COVID on, on, on citizens, on patients. But today I'd like to talk about how we inoculate the business of your practice uh, against COVID, um, which I think under these times, uh, surely uh, I think quite a few uh, practices and practice owners are certainly feeling the impact. So in terms of talking points today, I'd like to cover um, some COVID-19 data trends that we are seeing uh, through our, our business. Um, from that, really unpacking what the impact of those trends are on the business of practices. And then lastly, some practical steps that can be taken uh, as per the title to inoculate uh, the practices against these trends. And that should cover about uh, 20 odd minutes or so. So, so COVID-19 data trends, what do we see? Um, and this is really taken from our transaction data. Um, it's hot off the press. Uh, you, what we will show you is weekly data uh, as of uh, yesterday evening, or I guess midnight last night. Um, and really what we've been doing is since the, the, uh, the announcement of lockdown, we've been tracking um, the patient encounter volumes uh, on a weekly basis. And these are what I'd like to share with you now, just to get a sense of, of how things are tracked. Um, importantly though, are some uh, important benchmarks. So we're uh, 24 weeks into when lockdown uh, started. You'll see the major milestones there, lockdown. Then what I like to uh, call uh, lockdown season two, given that Netflix is so popular. We then went into level four, level three, and just a few weeks ago, uh, level, level two. The little asterisks are also very important. On a weekly basis, uh, volume data is very sensitive to the number of working days or public holidays. So you'll see in weeks 22, 21, in fact, 19 weeks ago, we had two public holidays, and then weeks 12 and four weeks ago was, was our last one. And that's important to look at because obviously the, those particular uh, weeks, we expect to be um, somewhat affected. So the first look we look at is really an aggregated view across all our disciplines. Uh, this is over 5,000 practices, probably over 8,000 treating doctors. Nationally, across all areas, demographics, you name it, uh, really in, in all different areas. Um, uh, and really just uh, a large portion of general practitioners. We have some specialists, we have the allies as well, um, and so on. So this excludes hospital transaction data, it excludes um, pathology and ex excludes uh, radiology for now. We'll take a look at one of those two uh, a bit later. And so this is what we see over this period. Um, middle of March being 25 weeks ago, we benchmarked that at 100% of volume. Uh, already in the week leading up to lockdown with the announcement of lockdown, uh, the numbers started dropping. And of course, during lockdown season one and season two, uh, drastically reduced volumes. After level four, uh, the volume started picking up somewhat. Um, after level three, once again, started picking up. Uh, the 63% around week 12, you'll see there's a public holiday, so one could probably interpolate between the weeks 13 and 11 in terms of recovery. And then we started seeing some, some nice recovery. Um, and then oddly, things started to flicker a bit uh, as of weeks uh, five weeks ago. Again, weeks four has to be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, and also last week needs to be um, taken with a pinch of salt, that 69% number. And the reason being, given that the cutoff was yesterday at midnight, not all claims will have been submitted. And you'll see that's one of my personal banes uh, later, um, where um, practices aren't necessarily sending in real time. And therefore, you will probably need another week or so to get a real view of, of what last week was like in terms of patient encounters. So really what we see is obviously impact during lockdown, a gradual comeback after, ground, uh, after lockdown, but then an easing off, which we'll talk about just now uh, towards the, the last few weeks. Um, more importantly is really the, the volume by disciplines. And the first one and the closest one to us, of course, is the general practitioner volumes. Um, and this is really what, what transpired or what has transpired over the last while. Um, again, a significant drop over lockdown, uh, a strong comeback, particularly after level three. In fact, we got to 90% uh, 
uh, of pre-COVID volumes around about eight weeks ago. And then once again, we see this weird kind of tapering off uh, towards the end. Um, again, last week, probably we can't read too much into right now. Uh, hopefully there's a bit of a pickup after level two. So a good comeback after level three, but then slippage um, in the last few weeks. Optometry volumes tells a, a very different story. Um, and most optometries, of course, are based in shopping malls. And so it comes as no surprise that during lockdown, an absolute emaciation of, of volumes. Uh, but once level four kicked in, you see a, almost a step jump in recovery. Um, and since then, volumes have been quite, quite reasonable, not quite at the original levels, but, uh, but not too bad. Psychology volumes, uh, this is a great story that uh, we'll cover just now. Um, in fact, one of the most robust volumes throughout lockdown, and in fact, strong of late. Now, I haven't looked deep into the data, so this is my The World According to Louis. Um, probably, well, we know that during lockdown, uh, psychologists were one of the best adopters of uh, telehealth. So that kept their volumes going nicely, and particularly given um, uh, the way that uh, psychology is practiced, that it's, it's very attuned to that. And I suspect the 90s in the end, even last week, 97, which means it's probably 100 and something percent of March, might in fact have to do with the demand with really uh, patients uh, struggling over this uh, um, long six month period almost and, uh, and really needing care at the end of the day from a mental health perspective. Um, but uh, so that's a bit of a speculation. Uh, I guess we could dig in and, and, and have a look. Uh, but certainly the first parts, uh, the, the most robust um, during lockdown, uh, particularly boosted by, by telehealth. General surgeon volumes tells a, an interesting story. Um, so a nice pickup, uh, particularly after level four. And then we saw a dwindle. And I suppose no surprise, uh, as COVID beds started getting allocated, um, less and less uh, surgeries, only the real urgent surgeries were, uh, were, were really uh, taken on, uh, given the shortage of beds. But you can see quite a resurgence uh, of late, um, particularly two weeks ago, 98% compared to uh, pre-COVID. Uh, again, last week is not indicative, particularly with surgeons. Uh, typically, claims are quite delayed. There's motivation letters and all sorts of paperwork that needs to be done. So it'll be interesting to see in a week or two what that uh, date of service uh, week looks like. Um, but I think we see the two stories, some sort of comeback, then impact of the real peak of COVID and now hopefully some, some strong uh, recovery. Pathology volumes uh, tells, I guess, a predictable story, um, a big knock during lockdown. And then you'll see around about from weeks 10 uh, ago uh, in the peak of, of COVID and when the, the COVID testing machine was really working superbly in our country. In fact, the volumes were uh, above pre-COVID um, and then a bit of volatility going uh, in, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but you can see that strong uh, trend uh, during the peak period of, of, of COVID. And lastly, I thought it would be interesting to look at anaesthetist volumes because they, they tell a little bit of an seemingly unintuitive un story. Um, the volumes during weeks eight to weeks five were certainly stronger than um, general surgeon volumes. Um, and, and why is that? Well, I think we know uh, anaesthetists are, are a critical part to the ICU cases uh, of COVID. Um, and so a lot of the nature of work changed over that time. Um, and of course, putting themselves at risk but really involved in, in those ICU cases. And so during that, that, that real peak period in the weeks uh, eight to five ago, um, you can see that the volumes are, are stronger than the one-to-one -one mapping with, for example, general surgeons, which one would expect to have quite a close, uh, close correlation. So I hope that tells a story of uh, different disciplines and, and how the, the volumes, I think each, each discipline has got a different story to be told uh, based on, on how they have navigated over this, over this period. Another interesting uh, stat is the number of virtual consults. So the good news is that it quadrupled over the period. Uh, maybe the bad news is that relatively it's still very low. And this is a graph that shows virtual claims as a percentage of total claims. Uh, you can see that from Feb to July, uh, it really went up four times. But even then, only 2% of uh, total claims, which is quite counter 
uh, to what we see in the US and in the UK where these volumes went up to the, the 30s and sometimes even the 40% of all patient encounters. Um, so I think still the, a, a lot of opportunity there for, for the industry and ultimately for, for everybody, be you a patient, a doctor or in fact a student. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, just now. Um, what about future trends? So we've gone through these six, six uh, months. What is our view when we interpolate and model uh, going forward uh, over, the, over the next couple of months, at least until the end of the year? Um, we don't see that the volumes are going to return back to normality for the last uh, couple of months. And there's a number of important reasons for that. Um, we think at best we'll get to about 85% of, of volume Again, on average, uh, every practice and discipline will be slightly different. Um, and the, the reality is that the impact of COVID continues as a country, it's been mentioned once or twice already today. We've done a fantastic job of, of managing the situation for a whole range of reasons, call it the Africanism that we've got, uh, maybe a bit delayed, picking up some tricks from other guys, getting our stuff together, doing it really well, maybe a little bit of other inoculation. I think we've done well. But the financial impact in particular for practices, I think, is, 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 that, is that to continue. And why is that? Um, we're finding patients still wanting to stay away from practices if they can. Um, a very big issue is going to be that the high-risk patients, so your diabetic patients, your hypertensive patients, and so on, that desperately need to be treated, uh, are going to have to be proactively engaged because they are the most at risk of being infected and therefore the most likely to stay away, but the ones that need mostly the care. Um, and then, as was mentioned, there's uh, possibly a second wave at some point in time that, frankly, nobody quite knows now. Um, but that certainly is a possibility if we look at Europe, uh, hopefully not as bad as, as what they experienced, uh, as the prof said. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is the impact on medical scheme membership contraction. Uh, firstly, we're going to be seeing buying down, particularly in the new benefit year. Uh, just to, to financial pressures, but already when we speak to the CEOs of uh, administrators and some schemes principal officers, they initially were expecting an estimation of about a 4% contraction. Um, we think it's likely to be worse as the financial reality of the COVID pandemic starts to, to hit our country. And then, of course, towards the end of the year, uh, we experience the normal year-end seasonality. And one could argue that there are, uh, you know, maybe benefits that haven't been uh, taken up and maybe people don't run out of uh, uh, benefits as early as, as other years. Uh, but we all know people don't get sick in November and December, particularly when you're on holiday. And particularly for GPs, uh, it's a very, very quiet period um, over, over that time. So that's really just a summary of, of the data that we've seen and the trends that we predict over the next couple of months. Um, importantly now for us is to say, well, given that, what we know, what do we think are going to be the impact on the businesses of our practices? Um, and the first thing is really a back of the envelope calculation over what was the impact in terms of lost revenue over the last 24 weeks. And this is taken by really matching our transaction data together with the Council of Medical Schemes report. The 2018-2019 uh, report is out. And we've extrapolated that this with some medical aid inflation, inflation numbers to try and give an estimate of, of where we think 2020 is going to land up. Um, and here's the reality. If we look across general practitioners, specialists, dentists, and all the allies, the first curve I showed you, in essence, this gray area is lost revenue, lost opportunity, lost revenue. And if you take the industry numbers and we extrapolated our data to the complete uh, industry, across uh, every single doctor, uh, knowing having a good sense of what our market share is, then the gray lines, in other words, the spare capacity or the lost revenue over the last 24 weeks represent a staggering 9.1 billion rand, uh, ultimately of lost revenue to you doctors uh, across the nation. It is a massive number. And this really starts talking about the, the financial impact that this has had on, on, on your businesses at the end of the day. Of course, distributed, uh, each of you have taken some pain in that 9.1 billion rand. And if we take the 85% uh, approximation, uh, extrapolation for the remaining bit, uh, that means there's about another 2.9 billion rand that is still going to be lost uh, over this period. Uh, again, extrapolating, taking seasonality into account, and all those things. 
So it's no wonder that we see articles like this, uh, where private health uh, is talking to medical schemes, say, guys, you're probably a little bit ahead of your curve in terms of saving. Give us an upfront payment. We can settle afterwards, which unfortunately the answer was no. Um, but very importantly, over and above the revenue loss that's occurred and the revenue loss that's likely to occur, uh, another big consideration is the very real risk of increased bad debt. Um, ultimately, the patients that you are seeing are consumers, um, and these are the things that we know well. Um, unemployment rate now well above the 30%. This was a June stat. Um, just between Feb and uh, April, 3 million people uh, lost their, their, their work. Um, and very unfortunately, two thirds of those were women. Um, and it's across all sectors of the market. Even a big company like Dimension Data in May announced uh, a cut of 480 jobs. These were skilled people uh, that unfortunately, as a result of the downturn in the economy, uh, lost their jobs. Um, worldwide reports like this, again, the, the association to being a BRIC company, a country, um, the countries listed from the US, ourselves, India, and Brazil, the harshest to be hit economically. And really, I think the message here is the, the, the pandemic impact has, has hit us and we're navigating it well. We are now flying into the financial uh, pandemic uh, that's going to come as a result of this. Um, here's an interesting report from TransUnion. They did a bit of research in July. And really the question asked in one of the questions was uh, what bills and loans are you most concerned about your ability to pay? It's quite nice. They broke it up by uh, different generations. So you can find yourself there. Uh, but more importantly is that medical bills came up as one of the, the, the top concerns uh, when it came to the ability to, to pay in, in time to come. Uh, and that fits again centered in, in your practice and, and the business of your practice. Um, another impact on, on, uh, on practices, of course, is the risk of intermittently having to shut down. And in our very own uh, CRM system, we, in fact, have had to create a new reason uh, for transactions or a practice was not seeing movement in a practice. And that category is COVID-19, you know, doctors getting ill, um, as we'll, see, we'll hear about just now. Um, and that, of course, creates a disruption, at least for a couple of weeks. Uh, in that practice and ultimately the business of that practice. So a lot, a lot going on. And just on top of that, of course, to you as practice uh, uh, managers, owners, and ultimately caregivers, of course, at the same time, you experience uh, the risk to yourself and to your families and the stress that comes with it. Um, and maybe an opportune moment from all of us at HealthBridge just to say thank you for all you've done over these months, uh, a lot has been done about it. And I know dances and songs and all that's good um, and, and important. And from our side, our, our own little bits to just say thank you for everything you've done for us, for our families and, and for our country. Last but I'd like to cover really is, okay, so we know the trends, uh, there's uh, impact that's, that's not looking great. Uh, what can you do to inoculate the business of your practice against COVID-19? And um, I'm very pleased to announce that in fact, there are two vaccines, and these vaccines are double-sided, double-tested, double-blinded, with a confidence index of 99.8365%. And it doesn't come from Russia. Uh, it doesn't come in a Smyrna bottle, although uh, certainly from time to time, I'm sure you are, you are uh, tempted to, to take that vaccine as well. But on a more serious note, there are already two levers that you've got in your practice. The one is how do I recoup revenues? And the other category of vaccine is how do I either reduce or variable costs or variableize my costs so that in the end you can either go into the black or make a little bit of fair profit uh, by either bringing your revenues up to a certain uh, respectable level and taking opportunities to reduce some costs. So for the remaining odd few slides, I'd like to talk about some very practical things that tomorrow you can start doing your practice to really start shaping these two uh, dynamics. And the first one is and has to be telehealth. Um, that certainly is an opportunity to recoup revenues. Um, why is that? Well, it addresses a couple of key challenges. Number one, uh, as we discussed and we know, patients not wanting to come into practices, being fearful, particularly those ironically that really need to come in. Um, secondly, as we saw, there is spare consulting capacity uh, that can be utilized. 
Um, and uh, at times, doctors themselves having to self-isolate given uh, the situation. And lastly, it does, it, this is a new world. Uh, here we are at uh, 11 past nine on a, on a Monday, uh, talking to each other. Um, it does allow for flexible hours um, at the end of the day. Uh, there, it is a little bit of a savanna. It's a bit of a jungle out there. And I know that different medical schemes pay different amounts based on certain conditions and, and so on. And some of those rates, let's be frank, aren't great. We won't get into that today. Others are and are very fair. But in the end, no matter what, that spare capacity uh, can be utilized for the business of your practice to generate some additional revenue and ultimately for you to care for your patients. Um, so that certainly is, is one opportunity. And what we see certainly from research, and this was commissioned by Philips last year, is that the propensity both for patients and doctors to start taking on uh, telehealth is, is increasing. And this is particularly research done for, for our country. But certainly, so that is, is promising. We do feel, however, that there are some things to consider when thinking about telehealth. And the first ones are really hygiene factors, must-haves. Uh, number one, it's got to tie into your practice workflow. If you happen to be at home self-isolating or the patient's not with you, uh, but particularly for yourself, um, you know, there are ways that subconsciously work in your practice, the way appointments get booked, the way the file moves around, the way the billing is done. And now what you don't want to do is start doing an ad hoc process and ultimately those well thought out workflow processes uh, start breaking down and you land up start uh, losing medical records or, or in fact losing revenue as a result of it. So it's got to tie into your practice workflow, even though you might not be there yourself. Um, it's got to be single click easy for particularly your patients. No downloading of apps and clicking on and signing on and logging on with Facebooks and all sorts of stuff. It's got to be really easy. Uh, for both you, the doctor, and for the patient. Another important hygiene factor is security. We all read the horror stories of how Parliament got hacked into Zoom uh, and so on. And lastly, and particularly for the administrators, when we speak to senior people at, at the administrators, for some weird reason, and maybe understandably, very worried about did that telehealth consult actually happen? Uh, how do I know it happened? Uh, how can we audit that? And so whatever system or process you use, should be able to very clearly say, look, here it is. This is what happened. And you can track it uh, at, at your heart's content. And so these different workflows, as we call it, from when the patient is confirmed that he, he or she has an appointment, to how that appointment gets initiated, um, to how that appointment takes place, and ultimately, out at the end, how that patient encounter gets um, documented. And as a result, the ball goes through is of absolute importance. There are two factors, however, that we say are over and above the hygiene are important. Number one, uh, ideally, it should be seamless in terms of the clinical notes that are taken. Uh, it, those notes should be always available, irrespective of we, where you as a doctor are. Um, and so it should be an environment that allows you to not only make contact with your patient, either over video or just over voice, but at the same time, in that same context, in that same screen, be able to make your clinical notes and know that they're stored and are safe for next time that you need them, no matter where you may be. The second important factor is that um, given now that we're all virtual, of course, patient follow-up becomes even more important. And so having mechanisms where you can uh, follow up on the patient, be it a COVID uh, patient where you want to know what happens a couple of days down the line, where they're not tasting anything, versus the diabetic patient after the second podiatry visit. Um, these are things that more and more in a virtual way we're gonna to have to keep track. And we believe that the telehealth system should offer that kind of uh, facility to be able to do that. Then, as I mentioned, another way to recoup revenues, and this is certainly something that when speaking to schemes and to administrators, they are very keen on, on, on doing and assisting doctors with, is that uh, there's a very real problem. And that is, uh, and we see some of the unaccounted for COVID debts uh, unusually high. And this starts playing in a place where uh, those patients with chronic illnesses are left behind, of course, as the, the focus happens on, on COVID. And so solutions that allows you to go back and engage with your patients that uh, you can choose based on, you know, patients that saw me in the last six months from this year to this, this age to that age with these particular types of diagnoses, be it hypertensive, diabetic or whatever, to create an outreach program to say, hey, Louis, um, you're one of my esteemed diabetic patients. 
Notice that you uh, haven't come in over the last six months and have missed your repeat visit. Uh, remember, it's really important that we keep your diabetes in check. If you're uncomfortable coming in, uh, by all means, we can connect via the telehealth uh, facility, whatever you might have, uh, and create these kind of outreach uh, um, uh, programs. It's good for the business of your practice. It's good for the health of the patients. And it's actually good for the risk of the scheme. Uh, because of the downturn, the down the line costs that could be incurred if, if these conditions get get out of control. So it's just win, win, win all around, and uh, certainly a great way to recoup some some revenues. Um, maybe not so much recouping revenues, but recouping costs. Uh, the good news is you, I'm sure, will know by now, is that you can claim for PPEs. Uh, Discovery led uh, the way there, but the other schemes have, have followed. Uh, again, it's the second jungle in this new space, exactly how you claim for a mask across multiple patients uh, over a day across multiple schemes and account for the gloves and so on. But your PMA system should be able to uh, handle that. It should be loaded up with the latest rules and pricing. And uh, in the end, this is a cost and particularly under, under times where the, the revenue is under stress, uh, there's no reason for you to be incurring additional costs and not recouping them when, when, you, when you can. Then in terms of reducing costs, that was around how you recoup revenues. How do we reduce costs? And, and this one is number one important for me. And Howard, I see that you're on, online today. Uh, you were there with us at Health Boots leading the charge. Please, doctors, be like a pharmacy. Um, send in real time and collect outstanding monies in real time. And uh, I joined Health Boots. I had hair. Maybe you can see I don't have hair yet. And my job is still not complete. Because as much as we came out with real-time claims in the year of September 2000, uh, Howard and myself and a few people, uh, we are still in a place where general practitioners on average take seven days from date of uh, service to date of submission. Specialists, worse, uh, dentists, optometrists, not the bad, although they are really point of sale encounters. And then allies, you guys, if you're out there, you kind of at the 15 day average. Now, this is an average. There's no such person as Dr. Average but uh, it gives you a sense. And that just heightens your chance of bad debt because by the 14th day, the person feels better. 99% of people have good intention to pay, but they tell themselves a story that I've got medical aid, this will be covered and they put it in a pile and that pile ends up in file 13. And ultimately as a result, practices generally trade between the five to 10% bad debt, which is not a good business at the end of the day. To, to, any, to any other industry standards. So send in real time, collect the money before the patient leaves. The technologies are there, not just ourselves, our competitors, the industry, the medical aids, you're gonna make some tweaks in your practice and set some expectations maybe with your patients. Uh, but this is, is really just particularly in the strong situation of this financial debt, consumer financial debt that's looming, that picture about the concern for paying medical bills there's no reason why you should be at the back of the queue based on the service that you delivered. Then another reduce, way to reduce your costs is maybe counterintuitively, move your PMA to cloud. Um, in terms of total cost of ownership, it is cheaper than desktop. It is actually safer in terms of data than desktop these days. We've had cases where doctors' PCs have been stolen uh, with all their, their patient confidentiality data on it. It is now fast. Uh, the internet largely has arrived to South Africa. Um, and perhaps and intuitively, now is probably a perfect time, particularly in these low volume times where your practices are under less pressure. Maybe this is the time to make the switch, retrain staff and a few workflows uh, to really set yourself up for, for the future, given that it's a little bit uh, quieter right now. The other way to reduce ultimately your costs is also to, to move, take, a, to take away those paper files and move to a cloud-based uh, EMR, digitize your, your clinical records. Um, why is that? Well, it's not just the cost of the paper files that you incur from time to time. Uh, those filing cabinets are expensive and they come in, in chunks of the thousands of rands every time you go to buy another one. But more importantly, it's occupying costly floor space, which perhaps you could be using for something, maybe a, a nursing station or something like that, to on the one hand, uh, look after your practice, your patients better, but at the same time to boost your revenues. Um, and importantly, not only that, but a proper EMR system, electronic medical record system, should automatically and uh, naturally spew out the complete and accurate bill 
uh, without it having to be recaptured at the front desk or the back office again. And of course, the great thing is you have access anywhere, anytime. Um, here's an interesting example uh, of, a, a, of Dr. Lee based in, in KZN. Uh, this is a snapshot of her data with her permission. Uh, what I want to draw your attention is to this one. She has pivoted her business, to use the cool word, uh, where more than half her, her patient encounters have now moved to uh, virtual consults, uh, really embracing this new world of cloud. Uh, There's a great story from here. I'm not going to take you through every single word because we're running out a bit late, but this was a very cool sentence, I thought, um, from Dr. Lee saying, there's a lot of negativity circulating lately, but having access to this telehealth feature has, in a way, kept me positive about my own business. And uh, that just shows great resilience. Things have changed, inevitably forever, in one way or another. But um, it's, it's also an opportunity to adopt new ways and think creatively about the business of your practice going forward. Lastly, there are some opportunities to variableize costs if you haven't already. Certainly, um, a lot of the technology partners are now open to charging you a percentage of revenue, which means when your volumes drop, as in now, uh, the, their costs to you will also lower. They're completely aligned with ultimately the turnover of your practice. And it might be an option to start considering bureaus at this point in time. Um, the great thing is they too typically charge uh, a, a percentage of revenue collected, not even billed, but collected. Um, you might have the opportunity to move some, some fixed costs in terms of uh, staff costs. Uh, they are typically very good at bad debt collection. Um, and that might be uh, another thing to consider just to variableize your costs so that you're not stuck with a fixed rate every month when your revenues have bottomed out uh, and, and also you think for, for the next while. So in conclusion, um, what are the key takeaway points? Uh, as has been mentioned both by uh, our previous two speakers, I think as South Africans, we can be proud in terms of how we've navigated the storm and are navigating it. Um, I think we are, are, are doing it rather well. It's not over, but we've done well. However, the impact on the business of practices is real and is going to be felt for a time to come. And there are some key risks, particularly along the bad debt side. So as a result, there are some, however, there are some strategies that we can uh, act on. Uh, some of them in the categories of recouping revenue and others in terms of either reducing or variableizing costs. And lastly, I'd like to leave you with a quote, which I believe wasn't him, but certainly he's been uh, uh, affiliated to it, uh, or Darwin. It's not the strongest, but the most adaptable that survive. Um, and certainly this is a, a time for the businesses or practices to adapt, uh, not only to survive, but in fact, in the new year to come to thrive in, in the new world of, of healthcare. Thank you very much. I hope you found that uh, uh, interesting and informative, and uh, certainly would be very happy to take some questions at the end if, if there are any. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Um, very informative, and I think that, um, you know, as important for us as discussing the actual COVID story, the COVID um, science of COVID is actually the science of our practices. So. There are a lot of questions on this um, that have come up in our GP group for quite some time. Um, I think what I'm going to do just in terms of time is um, I'm going to maybe just allow one, I'll take off the Q&A one question, one or two for Prof Shub, for, so we just have a three, if we could, we'll keep it very brief. So maybe even just one question for Prof Shub. Um, while we do that, um, I'm going to just run a poll because it's very interesting to see whether the Doctors are on here. We've got over 400 doctors here, whether they're experiencing the same thing that the overall data is showing. So um, I'm going to launch the poll. Um, and Dan, I, I don't know if you're on here. I don't know if I allowed the panelists to vote. Um, yeah, yeah panelists okay. can't vote, but it's all good. Okay, okay, fine. So that's fine. It's only a few. So, so if you just read there, you'll see it says, how do you think you'll pay this year's August, which has already been turnover compared to last year's August? Uh, we're interested to know, does it go down by up to 25%, 50%, 75%? Was it similar or has it increased because you may be doing more telehealth or, you know, whatever, and the reason you may be doing more COVID and before you didn't. So just while I ask Prof Shiv that question, if you want to vote on that and we'll see, um, I'll just take the top question at the moment for 
Prof Shub. So it was actually asked by Howard Saxton, who we've invited from Healthbridge to join um, the panel. I mean, so to, to the, the talk, um, Howard is actually one of the founding members of Healthbridge. Um, he'd like Prof Shub to explain why viruses actually peak and then decline rather than just to continue to infect people exponentially. So in other words, in a situation where we don't have herd immunity and where people aren't you know, being the fire break, so to speak, um, from person to person in terms of, of infectiousness, why, why, why will it, why, why, other than um, this concept that you've said about the, perhaps the, the, the virus becoming um, less strong, why will the, why, why will the epidemic go down? I mean, why wouldn't it just continue on and on until everybody's been infected if we don't have a vaccine? Yeah, no, thanks very much. Uh, the reason why the epidemic comes down is that the virus just doesn't have enough susceptible hosts to infect. So th that happens when, first of all, from natural infection, people that are infected, a certain, a certain proportion will develop immunity. That's the one thing. But probably importantly are the, are the interventions the physical distancing, the masking, the hand washing, et cetera, et cetera. That, then, that brings down that reproductive number. That, that, that reproductive number is a key thing which governs the, that epidemic curve. In other words, when, they, uh, epidu uh, when the uh, reproductive number, the R0, is at its best for the virus, that's 2.5, then the epidemic will go up because the virus has got hosts to which to infect. As we intervene, we can intervene in a number of ways by the masking, et cetera, et cetera, of all those non-provisional interventions, we stop the virus having access to susceptible hosts. Therefore, there are less and less susceptible hosts and it starts coming down again. And obviously vaccines will be an artificial way to increase the, to, to reduce the number of susceptible hosts. So it's a balance really, and it's a, it's a temporary balance. Because what happens as the epidemic comes down, the virus has got fewer and fewer susceptibles to infect, the epidemic comes down, the epidemic comes down. The virus, of course, does not disappear. It's still there at a very low level, still having a few susceptible hosts that infects. As susceptible hosts build up and we don't intervene, then, of course, the, the epidemic will go back up again, and that's when you have a second wave. Does that explain great. it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks, Prof. Um, yeah, so okay, so I'm... It's nothing to do about the virus getting weaker, because in fact, the virus becomes more transmissible. The virus mm. getting weaker just produces less severe disease. It's, it's the balance of how we stop the virus infecting, either naturally or, if, or artificially. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna just share the results of the, of the poll. Um, so the, the results showed that uh, the vast majority of doctors here said that their, that their turnover had decreased by up to 50% and, and, and quite close after that 25%. So we, we, that really shows a huge decrease. You know, even though some of them weeks have shown 75 and 80% of turnover, we're seeing that certainly on the ground here, at least the perception from doctors are that they are really, you know, if you average that out, somewhere between 25 and 50%, they are, are, are decreased on their turnover, which shows how significant um, the, the information is that Louis shared with us and, and what can be done hopefully about it to improve the situation. Um, I, don't, I don't want to um, waste much more time because we, we I do have a couple more polls, but we can always do that on the GP group. So what we'll do now is well, I just want to move on to the next section. And we're very blessed to have uh, a few doctors here who have agreed and, and been brave enough to come forward and talk about the experiences of COVID-19. Um, as I said at the beginning, we're joined tonight by two great healthcare professionals, um, Peter Fagan, Peter Klein Fagan, who is known to a lot of you. She's a trauma counselor, a life coach, and she's so involved with so many patients in terms of really helping them to deal with traumatic instances in their life. Um, she, she runs corporate um, events she, she, and, and, and training. And, and she really just most importantly is so in touch with like the human condition and how we deal with these difficult situations in our lives. Um, the other person who I'll introduce at the same time is David Abramson, who's a clinical psychologist. He's been on a lot of panels over COVID-19. Um, he deals with 
um, families, kids, adults, and also someone with so much empathy and so much understanding as to how um, the mind and psyche works. And um, I've asked them to join us tonight. I'm going to like take a bit of a back seat here, and I'm going to allow them and ask them to just help facilitate the stories that our doctors have to share in, in terms of what they've experienced. Um, I've asked each doctor to just, you know, try and just very briefly, I mean, it's already half past nine, but just talk about, um, you know, what you experienced. We can go over time. It's not, you know, this is just time for us to really learn from one another and grow. And, um, you know, between Peter and David, I'll be able to, you know, facilitate this part of the talk. So if I could hand over as the next speaker to Karen van der Merwe, who's one of the GPs, who, who, as I said, started the GGPC, who had COVID herself, and she can tell us her story. Um, Dan, have we promoted Corin to the panel? Yeah, uh, I think I just needed I to know. unmute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Um, so this is what I look like, um, and my name's Corin. <laughs> my first time giving a talk on Zoom, so a very exciting moment for me. Um, anyway, when Dan asked me to share about my COVID experience, I thought, well, it wasn't that severe, and uh, is anyone really going to care about my, my experience? Um, but nevertheless, looking back, you know, it was an emotional time, it was a challenging time, and a stressful time, so I thought, you know, why not? Maybe someone will find something interesting along the way, maybe someone will benefit from my story. So uh, it was a Saturday morning and I woke up feeling anxious, but I was having an interview at 7.02 on that day. So I thought I'm just nervous. And I did my interview and afterwards I realized I still felt funny. I had abdominal discomfort, a bit of diarrhea and, and, and nausea. And, and then I thought, shucks, I've also got a headache and I'm feeling feverish. So of course I was in complete denial. Like most of our patients, they'll come in. The first thing they'll say is, doctor, I don't have COVID, but I'm just here to check. <laughs> and I thought, well, let me just check because I've got to work on Monday. So I'll just get the negative test so that I feel better about working. And uh, of course, then I compulsively checked my phone um, for the next 24 hours. And eventually this result came through and it said positive. And I must say, I, it was just one of those life changing moments for me to see this positive result. You know, how could this possibly happen to me? How did I get it? How sick would I get? How many people had I already given it to? Um, and then I thought back to the last few days and I thought, who have I seen? Where have I been? And I must say, I seriously considered just pretending it didn't happen. Uh, just thinking, well, no one will know. I'll just keep dead quiet. Um, it's just so much effort and so much PT. But eventually I realized I actually have to tell people that this has happened. So, of course, Murphy's Law is I've been to the hairdresser for the first time. So I had the hairdresser. And uh, my son had been for a walk with his friend. And I had to phone the mom and say, I actually had a COVID test. And I didn't even think that he shouldn't go for a walk with you. I myself, I felt a bit like a criminal confessing a crime. Um, anyway, I must say, everyone was very kind. And no one got angry with me, which I thought they might. Um, anyway. I wasn't really prepared for how ill I'd get. I thought I'm 43, no comorbidities. I'm gonna fly through this. But it was actually a lot worse than I thought. I had muscle aches, headaches, nausea, a very runny nose, which I was convinced couldn't be COVID, nose ulcers. And the most prominent symptom was extreme fatigue. Uh, I just didn't get out of bed for the first week. Second week, I was lying on the couch or on a picnic blanket. Um, I didn't completely lose my sense of taste, but I couldn't taste terribly well. Coffee tasted like dishwater, much to my horror. Um, and then I also got some funny rashes, which was a bit bizarre. I had little vesicles all over my body and a very itchy left index finger, which I know sounds really silly, but it was so itchy, I've actually got a callus there from scratching it. And that took two months to resolve. And I think it's just evidence of when you've got a new disease, no one knows anything about. And it's kind of stressful because you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, I mean, having said that, I, I got off easy. Unlike some of my colleagues, I didn't have respiratory symptoms. I didn't have myocarditis. I didn't have neurological problems. 
Um, and some, and I'm on a COVID support group for doctors, and many of them have had ongoing fatigue, shortness of breath on exertion. Some are three months post-diagnosis. They are still tired, still battling to work. Um, I was tired for about two months. Uh, but, but fortunately, about 10 weeks later now, I am feeling like my energy is back. Um, so just a few points about what it's like being a doctor with COVID. Uh, the first one is shame. I have this feeling of shame, like how could I possibly get it? You know, I know everything. I should know how to protect myself. And of course, everyone says, where did you get it? You know, where do you think you got it? And like, well, I actually don't know how I got it. I hopefully did everything right. I'm kind of glad about the aerosolized transmission that Prof Shu was talking about because it makes me feel a bit better. Um, and then uh, there's also relief, to be honest, because, you know, now I've had it. Kind of the worst has happened and I've got antibodies. So that's the nice part. Um, and then there's the isolation, you know, you don't realize how hard isolation is until you've done it. Prescribe it for your patients. Uh, I felt like a leper in my own house. Um, you know, the whole family had to sort of keep their distance. Mom was infected and hubby was sleeping on the couch and it, it really, that was tough. Um, in terms of my practice, I was lucky in that I had colleagues who could step in and, and run it. And I'm hopefully going to get some money out of PPS. My husband is an anaesthetist. He also ended up getting it. He um, didn't work for more than two weeks. And he had a false, we think it's a false negative test because he had classic symptoms. And we're not sure if he's going to get PPS. So there is that stress. And I must say, the whole stress of COVID financially has been a thing. Um, yeah, so that's my self-study of COVID. I hope it's given me more empathy for my patients and uh, a greater understanding of an extremely diverse disease. Thanks. <laughs> David, can I jump in? Do you mind? Oh, of course, I... absolutely. So, so thank you so much for, for sharing the vulnerabilities that you've experienced during this experience. It sounds really, really frightening and really, really relatable in the same breath. You know, I think there are a lot of people that are worrying, you know, whether you're the doctor or you're just the average person in the street, worrying about whether they're infecting people, whether they are going to be terribly ill, going to go to hospital. And I think like your, your real, the, the part that, that really stuck out for me was your, when you said you compulsively checked your phone, you know, waiting for those, those results to come through. And I think that as a doctor, I'm sure you've gotten phone calls from your patients, hammering, 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 have my results come, have my, my results come. And I think that if there's anything that's going to deepen our empathy for our patients and, our, and, and, and clients and for our fellow colleagues is understanding the heightened level of anxiety that partners with this COVID-19. You know, it's such an intense anxiety that we never anticipated. You know, in the very beginning, it's, oh, it's a flu, it's, it's okay, you'll be all right, most people will be okay. But that anxiety has led us into this mental health crisis. And I think just relaying some of your anxieties and the deep vulnerabilities of sitting with shame that you, you expressed, it gives people that human touch and we can deepen our empathy for everybody that has gone through it. So thank you for sharing those points in particular. Well, it's a pleasure. <laughs> David, do you have anything else you want to add? I just wanted to absolutely, I think what stands out for me is when you talk about shame, you know, and, um, you know, um, Peter and I are psychologists. We're not, you know, medical doctors, even though some people do call me a doctor and I quickly phone my mom to tell her that that has happened. So <laughs> be very proud of me. But um, um, we're not medical doctors, but I think we have a similar experience being, um, you know, looking off to clients or patients. And I think one of them is that somehow, if you uh, are a psychologist, that you don't have problems, that somehow, you know, you know you're the perfect parent and, 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 and run your life perfectly. And I think for me, you know, when I've seen um, doctors, I think one of the things is that it's hard for doctors to be sick and it's hard for doctors to, to actually look after themselves. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, Peter will also talk, talk about maybe a bit also that as a psychologist, you know, we also find it so difficult to, to, to do what we tell our clients or our patients to do. 
So I think that's one of the things that stands out for me is, um, you know, this idea that we can also be sick, we can also have vulnerability, um, and, uh, and, you know, that we don't give actually 120% to our clients and to our patients, that we actually make sure that we leave some stuff for ourselves uh, and for our families. Um, so I think, in, 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 you know, in some ways, um, I think it's so important that we, um, that we you know, we, 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 had, we look at that shame and we say kind of why, are we, why do we have to be so perfect in what we do, you know, that actually we can be vulnerable and, and really what are our patients going to say, clients going to say, if we have had, um, you know, uh, corona, does this make us not, not good doctors or not good professionals? And I would venture to say no, that, um, you know, the answer is, is no, that they still have the same respect for you, um, oh. you know, as a professional. Yeah, and it's actually been wonderful um, going through COVID in a sense, because um, patients that have had COVID, and I'm quite open about it with my patients, I've just got that kind of relationship, and, and they so appreciate that you can understand what they've gone through and and actually, I mean, none of them are, are sort of blaming you or shaming you. I think it's, it's just yourself that does that. <laughs> but I've got over it, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think, again, I think that's such an important point because we are, you know, and again, we know sometimes we think as professionals, if we, if we think that our clients or our patients know that somehow we are vulnerable or you know, that they're going to not trust us or they're going to look down on us or somehow lose respect for us. I think for me, that's something that, uh, you know, is not, is, is in the majority of situations, not true. And I think, as you're saying, kind of, it actually brings you closer to your clients and to your patient to go like, hang on, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You actually know what I've been through. So, so instead of, you know, as you say, that initial response of being, feeling that shame, it really, really is about, you know, oh, that, that, that's pretty human of you. And, and that, and that makes you like me. And I think for me, patients really appreciate that. Okay, great. Thank you. That is really insightful. I'm going to move on just for the time. Um, the next doctor who, thank you for Karen for sharing your story. The next doctor I'd, I'd like to ask is uh, Dr. Frat Folds. Um, she works, she runs the teddy bear clinic at, at the Joburg Jail, Charlotte Macheke. And um, I won't say any more, but I'll just hand over to her. Just unmute. There we go. Sorry. Thank you for organizing a very informative evening. And um, it really is a pleasure to finally meet Karen. Um, so my experience with COVID, uh, yeah, so I work in a government hospital, frontline. I remember when lockdown first started, driving out, the streets were empty. You drive into the Joburg Gen and the parking is full. We were all there. We were all ready to fight and, and take this on. Uh, we were scared, but we were ready to take it on. Um, I was diagnosed on the 2nd of July and... Um, had a similar experience to Karen, where um, when I saw my positive results, I remember thinking, no, it's not positive, it's not possible. The only reason I checked it is because my mom was worried and kept saying to me, you know, are you fine? Are you fine? And I thought, okay, let me just double check. And I really thought I would be okay. I'm 46 years old, I'm pretty healthy. I don't have any previous comorbidities. Um, it's amazing what lockdown does to you. When they finally let us out of our jail, I started running with my kids um, and uh, exercising. And um, so, yeah, pretty fit. I do calls. And uh, the first week was harsh. Um, again, unlike Corin, I actually loved the isolation. They were calling me from Hatsola and they, the woman kept saying to me, Shema, are you okay? You know, like, it must be so lonely. And I said, no, it's actually wonderful. Finally, I don't have to deal with my husband and my kids. My husband counts as a kid as well. So no, I'm actually loving it. I got through, I got through Jane the Virgin in like a week, which was amazing. I finally found out what the fuss was all about. Um, and but I, I kept thinking something wasn't right because I was very tired and I just wasn't myself. I'm, I'm full of energy. I, I do a lot. 
And um, then sometime towards the second week, I started developing these terrible palpitations at risk. At rest. I spoke to my GP and, uh, you know, I, I, I think I actually owe him my life because uh, Rodney Feinberg is my GP. And when I spoke to him initially, he said to me, if right, there are two poor prognostic signs, the one is the resting tachycardia and the other one are the low sats. And I never experienced the low sats, but the resting tachycardia did worry me. I would literally be lying in bed because I couldn't move out of bed. Um, there was a point where I, I couldn't actually bath for three days and eventually I, I, I called my husband and my, my older daughters, I've got older daughters and I said listen just I'm going to get into the bath if you hear me scream come you know and the irony of it is that I actually passed out because that's when I started developing this terrible dizziness and dyspnea and again just like Karen said this this made heart disease suddenly so real for me because you see those cardiac patients with the very swollen feet, they can hardly move, they can hardly breathe, and you think, oh, you know, it can't be so bad. It is that bad. You, you literally, I mean, for me to get up and sit where I'm sitting right now, which was my little spot in the sun, I could maybe do half an hour of it a day. And so the symptoms got pretty bad, and um, as, as uh, we've all discussed, we, we don't like to view ourselves as being vulnerable. So I kept kind of ignoring all these symptoms. My heart was worrying me. It felt like it was jumping out of my chest, but I, I thought it would just pass. And then I happened to be speaking to my sister, who is a friend, who's a close friend with a cardiologist. And I said, oh, geez, my heart feels weird. And she said, you know, I'm tired of you not taking care of yourself. I'm phoning Dr. Yasmin Bira right now. And the next thing, Yasmin phones me. We happen to have been at medical school together. And she goes, Effie. She calls me Effie. She goes, Effie, what's the problem with you? Come on, you know, you, you need to come in. And I said to her, no, it's just I've started vomiting and I'm sure I'm dehydrated. She said, just come in. Let's have a look at you. And that's when it's, it's really, it's quite embarrassing because they treat you like you've got leprosy. I mean, I was pushed to the side when they did eventually let me into the hospital. They put a plastic covering over me. I was wheeled in um, and she started with blood tests and investigations and everything. And she eventually said to me, look, I just want to do an echo of your heart. And she turned around and said, if right, you've, you've got a myocarditis, you've got a pericardial effusion and you've got a myocarditis. And I, I, I said, oh, no, you're talking nonsense. You know, look again. And she said, no, you look. And I, I'm not used to looking at echoes, but I could clearly see that my heart was not beating. I mean, the part, my anterior wall for the doctors on here uh, was completely asynchronous with the rest of my heart. Um, and yeah, that's when it kind of sank in. I was in a ward with three other patients, um, bad pneumonias. Um, it was one of the worst experiences. It, it felt like people were drowning in their own secretions. Mm. Um, and I went home and uh, because as doctors, we don't listen. And I thought I was okay. And um, I thought I was getting better. And unfortunately, a few days after that, the symptoms came back with a vengeance and that's when I had to very reluctantly call Hatsola because again I thought no it's not happening to me and I ended up in ICU um, with changes ST changes to my heart which basically meant that my heart was under a lot of strain and suddenly overnight I just became a cardiac patient um, I had to be on, I'm, I'm on blood thinners, I'm on, um, I'm on beta blockers, um, I may have to actually end up with a, an ablative procedure to my heart. And, uh, and that really plays with my mind, I have to be honest, because my heart actually improved a few weeks ago, and I was feeling so much better and just really upbeat about it. And then a couple of days ago, the arrhythmia started again, and my heart literally goes from 
60 to 190 just randomly and I, I can feel it and um, again that vulnerability comes back and it kind of punches you in the gut in the solar plexus and it's like I, I think that's what COVID does though um, is that it has this boomerang effect where you think oh my symptoms are gone and they're not they they just keep coming back so yeah in a nutshell that's me and uh, I am very optimistic. I keep telling everyone that God is going to heal my, my broken heart. And I, I believe in the secret, much to my husband's dismay. <laughs> um, but I do. I, I really do believe that it will get better. And uh, I think it's probably also because the idea of someone doing a procedure on my heart is just doesn't sit well with me but again it could just be denial so yeah that's me mm. um interestingly enough i didn't pass it on to any members of my family but as karen said um i i did phone patients that i had been in contact with for about 10 days afterwards until people actually said to me please stop phoning because i was terrified of passing it on to them you know, we take a Hippocratic oath, first do no harm. And for me, my biggest worry, sorry, there's my cat. For me, my biggest worry was that I would actually pass it on to someone. Sure. David, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think, I think for me, when I listen to your story, um, you know, I think of something that I went through and it's so nice that a psychologist is able to kind of talk about himself for a change and, 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 and not here. ask other people. Yeah, I've got a whole audience. I might as well take advantage. But really, I think, the, <laughs> <laughs> you know, years ago when I started at practice, um, um, I was referred to a, a child who had lost both his parents in a car accident. And, and I was completely overwhelmed. And I thought to myself, you know, like, what am I going to do for this young man? And he came in and, and, and I was inexperienced and very nervous. And he literally spoke for, for an hour and a half and cried and, and he left. And I, and I literally said nothing the whole session, the whole session. And I, and I really, for a whole week until I was going to see him again, just felt so helpless because I, I just thought, what can I do for this guy? He's lost his parents. How is it going to help by him coming to talk to me? What is it going to he's be wasting his time and maybe I should change my profession because like you know what what can I actually tangibly do and I think for me when I listen to your story and I'm sure so many people have experienced COVID um you know it reminds me of what he what what happened when he came back the following week and he said to me I felt so you know obviously he was still traumatized and it's going to take you you know months and months to 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 move forward emotionally psychologically but he said to me in the following session, thank you so much. That was so, I felt better. Something felt better in me. And I learned such a lesson that day that, that even though we want to do things like, you know, if we are sick, you know, we, 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 you know, we look for practical things to do, you know, like what medicines are we going to take? And maybe as doctors, maybe we think this way, what can we do? What tests, what medicines, what can we actually do, which we can, you know, physically do. But I think for me, one of the power, most powerful things I learned that day was, and it might sound very, very, you know, uh, I suppose cheesy coming from a psychologist, but what, I, what that child taught me that day was the power of just listening. And I think for me, um, you know, that, that sometimes as professionals, it's so important that we, you know, like, and I think that sometimes even as a psychologist, what is it going to help to go talk to someone? You know, really, I'm, you know, what's it going to help, you know? But it's absolutely amazing. And I learned from that child that day, the absolute power of just going to talk to someone to get it out there. Um, and, and, and we can debate what it is and how it works. But I can tell you it again, I, I learn from my clients all the time. And, and that was one of the most powerful, um, you know, uh, lessons that I learned. And, and what I would say is that, that if right, you know, obviously experiencing such a trauma, you know, again, you know, and so many, and thank you for sharing. I mean, it's, you know, psychologists often say that, thank you for sharing, please excuse us. But I think for me, the most important thing is that, that to know that, and, and for, for, for doctors to know actually, 
that by actually going out there and speaking to, to a psychologist or to a social worker or even to a loved one, doesn't seem like you're doing anything. It can't see it, but it's amazing, you know, what it can do and how it can help you psychologically and emotionally. And that's what I learned from that young man that day. And, it, and it's always stayed with me all my years. So, so, you know, don't underestimate the ability to go out and share your pain or your experience with a professional or a loved one. It, it, it makes a difference. It really helps. I, 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 I just want to jump in there. You know, if right, I think it's actually palpable uh-huh. when you're describing your experience. I actually found myself like, like trying to catch a breath because I cannot imagine having all that knowledge, being a doctor and having all that knowledge, looking at all of these results in front of you and actually realizing this is your body. It's almost like this ultimate betrayal. And I wonder how many of, you know, all of your colleagues often like question those kinds of things when when medicine well, you know, when our health fails us and medicine may be a little bit tricky. You know, I've got a I've got a, a friend who's a biochemist and she has this little joke. She says, you can't trust science. It's forever changing, you know, <laughs> and it's it's quite a difficult thing to realize that this is what happened within your body. And I just want to thank you for sharing it, because we need to as as practitioners, we need to develop the depth of empathy and what is the truest form of empathy it is actually seeing each other feeling what our colleagues what our friends what our family members actually go through and what all of you doctors who have experienced this horrendous you know illness disease are doing in coming forward and speaking you're allowing the depths of empathy to start to permeate And that is what actually makes us better at what we're doing. And it deepens our resources. Just this alone, we need to reach out to our resource base to build ourselves up. And, you know, going on to what what David is saying, to just speak about it, we're allowing a lot of healing to happen in the fact that the resource base gets built and we've got, you know, people to lean on. So... Thank you, you know, for sharing it. You've definitely deepened my empathy and understanding how frightening it is even for you guys as doctors to go through this. Thanks. Thank you, Efrat. Um, so just to tell everyone what we're going to be doing with the time, I've got, we've got two more brief stories and, and, and then that will be the end of the formal part of this. Um, if there are doctors who still want to stay on and chat about the experiences, you're more than welcome. I'm not going to end the webinar. We can stay on for another, you know, so, so in the next, I'd say 15 minutes, we'll probably end the formal procedures proceeding, so to speak, but then we can still stay on because I know that for some people, this is really a, a, a really building experience. So um, without delaying, we are I'm privileged to have a doctor here who's from Durban. Um, he's, I haven't met him. He, I, I'm, I hope he's, I'm saying your name correctly. His name is Prithi um, Ramlachan or Ramlachan. Um, he's a GP in Durban and he got COVID and I'd like to invite him to share his story with us. Thanks, Daniel. And, and thanks to everybody. I must say that uh, listening to, to the previous experience of Karen and Abbott, suddenly you realize that, that COVID has another story. But it also bears out in all the webinars that we've attended and all the messages that we got from there, you start to live this process with the virus that you suddenly get. But mine took a little bit of a twist in the sense that my wife fell ill first and and she got sick on on the 14th of July. Uh, I admitted her on the 15th of July after she had a a little bit of a collapse uh, at home uh, and she dropped her sets to 80%. And I admitted her to hospital and within two days, she was on a ventilator. So she was in on a ventilator within two days. I was there at home. I was asymptomatic in a way. I did my test on the 15th of July, the day I admitted her. I had no symptoms for about two, three days. And then once she was on the ventilator, I don't know if that gave me symptoms, but I started to develop symptoms. Uh, I started to get lots of sweating and night sweats and the standing thing about it is the severe backache that uh, she experienced and I also had that and the nighttime two to four o'clock in the night 
the sweating that you would get that would wake you up. The sad part of all of this that I, I want to share with you is that this what I call uh, COVID-19 Robin Island. I didn't see my wife for 34 days. Uh, uh, and that was sad and it really is an indictment on us as carers because the hospital did not have a virtual visiting in place. I don't think many hospitals have them yet in place. But the only chance I got to talk to my wife or see her was when uh, the doctor who, who a colleague and a friend took his own cell phone and said, look, just see this picture of your wife. And you know, even though she's on a ventilator, you can see her at least, and that was great. And here I am sick in my bed and I'm seeing my wife, I'm taking all my steroids, getting all my bloods done, saw my family doctor who, who done all my tests, saw my IL-6 starting to climb, had a COVID pneumonia, but 13 days after I was had a positive test. So that suddenly taught me that don't say that it's all over because we say, well, 10 to 14 days, it's all over. It's not, it, it just goes on and the disease can keep you. So uh, that was the journey. I, I'll keep it short. My wife uh, was released from hospital 10 days ago. She's still on oxygen at home and I have on a concentrator uh, and I'm looking after her. Uh, myself, I've recovered after a month, but there are lots of things that I've learned from this and suddenly I can really care for my patients and realize that they can come out with these symptoms, which people talk about the post COVID experience, uh, the cardiac symptoms. My wife had to see a cardiologist uh, one week ago because she developed VF and also by Germany from COVID. So I, I see where you went through Afrat and, and, and I see that as something that you've experienced. And suddenly you find all of this coming in. So all the webinars is to teach you a lot and, and make you feel better that, hey, I have some knowledge but when you suddenly experience it, it becomes an experience of something else. So mm. my appeal is we need to start the caring. And I think that creating this COVID-19 Robin Island for patients without having access to the loved ones is not a nice thing. So I'll stop there and, and leave it at that to say, I'm happy and, and blessed that my wife is, is still with me. And, and she was the only one that came out of that whole ICU alive. All the others on sure. ventilators mm. did not make it. So I want to thank God for that. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, this, Daniel. This is, yeah, th this is a, a, a serious, serious, serious trauma. You know, we can all feel the heaviness of not being able to be there directly, you know, for your wife. And I think, you know, the prominent emotions when it comes to trauma is that helplessness and that hopelessness that we experience and there is nothing worse than that you know we've heard it time and time again that this whole the whole world has turned upside down and nothing is as it was everything has changed and I think part of putting the pieces back together and to have that incredible gratitude that we can so it's so palpable you know that your wife is home and you are caring and looking after her and you're together again having that gratitude and moving with that depth you know it helps build up that helplessness and hopelessness it helps us to understand that we've got to put one step in front of the other to be able to know what it is that we've been through who are we with the changes that have happened you know you are forever changed from this experience and experiencing the helplessness and hopelessness and I, I do, I wish for the two of you, you know, abundance of health. I hope that you, you guys are, are able to, you know, rely on each other with mending those feelings, you know, thank you for sharing them. And I really, I hope you guys make a remarkable recovery. Mm. That's thank really you. scary. Thank you. And maybe if I can add, um, you know, one of the things about this COVID, this, you know, people who are sick, people who are not sick, <laughs> Is this isolation and i think for me that's one of the most difficult things that people have experienced is that you know it's it's a normal i think um human reaction to want to gravitate towards people and to be physical with people when we are in distress and i think this is what's made um this COVID experience even so much more traumatic because 
I think for me, this idea of, of being in distress, um, whether you've got the COVID virus or you are um, isolated at home um, and you're not allowed to, you know, by the, you know, you're not allowed to be with people, you're not allowed to actually hug people. And, and, and I think for me, interestingly enough, you know, we've spoken a lot about, you know, telehealth moving forward and, you know, this, this is the future. Maybe, and I'm certainly I'm no expert, but I think for me, nothing is ever going to replace a face-to-face -face consultation where you sit down and you connect with your patient and you see them um, human being to human being. And, and I can say, certainly, I'm, as I say, not a medical doctor, but, but the experience of trying to do therapy um, through a screen has, has really been challenging and really takes something away from the interaction. And I truly believe, just like, you know what we are learning from the COVID experience is that isolation is 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 like is like the doctor said. It's like Robin Island. It's like a prison. It's a punishment. And I do think for me that that nothing will replace in the end that face to face consultation, um, because because there's there's a lot that's lost over you know over over screens and 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 in the interaction. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming on here. Um, I'm not going, I'm going to just move on to the next one because of time. Um, so the last formal story for tonight is um, by Dr. Lana Marcus. Um, and Lana and I, I know Lana quite well. We actually have a story of Robin Island ourselves because we, our parents happen to be married to each other, but that's we only got to know each other in the last year or two. Um, and we haven't seen each other for a couple of months because of this whole COVID story. Lana got COVID and, um, and yeah, that was maybe, I don't know if that was the beginning of the families not getting together as much as we should, but um, it's good to see you on the screen. And Corin and had told me that Lana would be keen to share the story and I'm very happy to have you. So go ahead. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Ray. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dan, thank you for coordinating these meetings. You're awesome. And Dan Stillerman, who makes it all possible with his phenomenal Zoom exper expertise. It's just amazing. Thanks to everyone, and good evening to all our medical colleagues. Um, I think as doctors, we have a need, even more so than regular people, for predictability and for control. And the biggest problem with COVID is that robs us of both of those things. I remember one of our lecturers at med school said, diseases don't read textbooks. But as doctors, we would very much like diseases to read textbooks and behave in a predictable manner. Now, this damn virus came out of nowhere and it does whatever the hell it wants. And that is very, very frustrating. So to be blindsided by COVID is very, diff very difficult. Um, I'll give you a bit of background. I'm just going to check that no one can hear that I'm saying this in my house. I'm a neurotic human being. Um, I'm the mother who cuts the grapes in the lunchbox. Um, I'm the one who checks the doors are locked every night. When I'm doing my grocery shopping, I'm checking that none of the foods have been tampered with and they're all still in pristine packaging. Um, so COVID, this extended to, to COVID. Um, I was one of those 40% of doctors, Karen, who wipes down their groceries. Um, um, my office, I, I bought so much PPE for my office that I really hope it stays in fashion after the pandemic because I think I still have plenty of it to wear. Um, and we were really strict. We didn't do the social engagements. There wasn't another human being in my house. I used to shed my clothes after I went to the shops. In fact, if I could have hosed down my children in the middle of winter after they came home from school, I might have actually done that, but I didn't. Um, so I really thought we are safe, but you know, the problem is that there's always that missing link. And unfortunately the missing link was my hubby. Um, so, um, on, and also you've got to bear in mind that in June, we didn't, we'd only been treating COVID for about two months. I mean, I understand the pandemic started earlier, but we all started probably seeing cases in our practices around May or June. And if you look at all the infographics that we got, they said congestion isn't a feature. It's about 2% of patients. So on the Tuesday evening, when Hubby got snotty, I was like, oh, he caught a cold. How on earth could he catch a cold anyway? Because how are you supposed to catch anything with social distancing? And I passed him the Omni and I passed him the antihistamines and I said, suck it up and get on with it. Um, and then on the Thursday evening, I got really congested. Um, and now I'm thinking, Dan, he's given it to me. Had a really bad night with all the snot. 
woke up on the Friday, sent my child to school. In fact, I might have sent both the children to school, thinking nothing of it, and then spent the morning exhausted, again thinking, well, you slept badly, you've been snotty, and, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all okay. And then I just couldn't get warm. I spent the whole day feeling cold, but I was checking my temperature. I didn't have a fever. I just felt cold and tired. Um, and it was only in the late afternoon that I took my temperature for the 75th time, not neurotic, and it had gone up to 38. And at this point, I'm thinking, oh, that can't be good. And it's probably not sinusitis. So on the Saturday morning, up I got, first person in the queue, had my COVID swab, noticed that the young lady who was swabbing me was not wearing goggles. And when I proceeded to cough in her face involuntarily, thought, oh, crap, I hope that I don't have it. Um, okay. Then um, the results came through on Sunday night. And, you know, I don't think we've had as much pandemonium in terms of phone calls and WhatsApps since I think we got engaged or perhaps the birth of our children because it, it, it was just like panic stations. We had, I had to get hold of the school. I had to say, look, I'm really sorry. I know my son was there on Friday, but you know, we, what are we going to do? So I had two children to contend with. We had family members who were convinced we were going to die. I had a, a seven-year-old who was also convinced we were going to die and was crying in his bed because he knew something was going on. Um, and you know, the, the funny thing is that through all of this, I've never ever had concern for myself. It's always been concern for my family. Um, it's, it's weird. I've never ever thought, oh my God, what if I get really sick and end up in hospital or something bad happens to me. But the moment a single member of my family gets ill, it is, it's frightening. Um, and there we go back to the lack of control. So as far as, as far as the symptoms go, I think that, I think we've all heard all of them by now. Um, we're all in practice and we've heard about weird rashes and the gastric symptoms and the nasal symptoms and the respiratory. Um, I had quite a few of them. Um, nothing debilitating, um, but I, I, th I think the primary emotion that I would kind of mention when it came to COVID is frustration. First of all, the frustration of the, the total lack of predictability, because for three hours on one day, I'd be sitting with this terrible base, chest pain at the base of my lung, then it would disappear, then my legs would start aching, and then, there would, then my legs would improve and then there would be a run of diarrhea. And it, it, was, it was always something different. So there was the frustration of just not knowing what was going on, um, or what to, what to expect in terms of my symptoms. Then they also say that um, the majority of patients who are going to deteriorate do so between day five and eight. So there I'm now sitting between day five and eight, checking my, with a pulse oximeter on. I don't know if the shortness of breath was psychosomatic because my SATs always up, but it, 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 it was a real concern. And then the other bit of frustration is just not being able to do what you could normally do. You know, I'd hang the washing and then have to sit down for half an hour. Now that's, you know, that, that, that's what you would expect from like an eight-year-old with heart failure. <laughs> so there was a, a lot of, there was a lot of frustration, but um, I've had a very difficult 10 years medically, not, thank God, not chronic, but I've had two disastrous pregnancies. And I think any woman who's been pregnant, even if they haven't had complications, understands the helplessness associated with having to incubate something in your body and there's nothing that you can do. So disastrous pregnancies make that even worse. And then about six years ago, I landed up with sepsis with a parapharyngeal abscess that they wouldn't operate on. They said it was too close to my parotid. So there I just had to rely on the, the grace of God and just hope that things would settle and they did. So this is now probably the fourth event in the last 10 years. And I think that I'm lucky that I've developed resilience from the things that, are, that I've been through, that I didn't find COVID all that overwhelming, but I can definitely understand how one could find it overwhelming. And by the grace of God, we were all fine. And I've made a pretty decent recovery. I'm not sure if my still slightly elevated heart rate is uh, deconditioning, <laughs> definitely not exercising as much, or if it is maybe something lingering, but um, taking it day by day back in practice, running the kids around, and thank God, life is back to normal. Sure, it, it definitely is not um, a simple process of look after yourself, just go, to, go rest and take care of yourself. You've got so much on the go, which is what we're seeing with a lot of people, whether you're a doctor, just a mom, or whatever it is, there are so many different hats that I think is also something to bear in mind, that when we're sick, with COVID, it's not simple. It's just not simple. You can't just focus on resting. And something that resonates, because we've chatted before um, on another webinar, 
And something that still resonates is how you explain how like you're, you're not really concerned for yourself, you're concerned for others. And that's part of your training. That's your doctor's hat. You know, it's the of service aspect of your career. And I think it's quite an important thing to, to start looking at what the definition of resilience actually is, because thankfully it's evolved. You know, resilience we know is, is how you bounce back, right? It's how, how quickly you bounce back. But actually in the Harvard Business Review, they came up with a new definition and it's how you restore along the way so that you don't have to bounce all the way back, okay? And I think if there's anything that we can learn and, and hear from your story is let's listen to ourselves. Let's not ignore, you know, we, we, we giggle and we joke about, you know, being out of breath and, and being out of practice and that kind of stuff, but let's not ignore it. You know, let's practice that resilience, check in, pull on those resources, you know, rest whenever you can and do those things. I mean, I'm not the doctor, but I'm just asking that we just listen to ourselves a little bit deeper so that we can carry on our of service that we are so privileged to be able to do. Mm. I hope that makes sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'd also like to make two points. One is like around the predictability and that's again, you know, we talk about, um, you know, why it's been so difficult from a psychological perspective is because I mean, this, this virus has been so unpredictable, you know, again, you know, and, and the information has been so sporadic and kind of we're learning as we go along. And I think for me, understandably, that's creating so much anxiety because we thrive. And I would imagine, especially as, as doctors, you know, I'm going to make a huge generalization and say, you know, tend to be a type personalities, like to be, be in control, like things to, you know, to have a predictability about them. And I think for me, two things in that point is that, if you, you know, if we don't have the predictability, then our anxiety rises. And I think that's understandable that we've all experienced, um, you know, a heightened level of anxiety. But I think, I think the one thing is, you know, which, which might be difficult as doctors is having too much information, knowing too much. And I think for me, you know, it, it might sound glib to compare it to like, you know, um, all the info, you know, the, 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 the plethora of information that, that we have these days on, um, you know, on all topics. And I think sometimes when we have too much information, it overwhelms us and it kind of like, and actually can also cause anxiety. And I think one of the hardest things being a doctor must be to be the patient and, and to let, let yourself be looked after. And I think for me, you know, even before COVID, when I've seen a couple of doctors, one of the hardest things is, for, as I've said before, is for them to, to listen to their own advice. And um, I think, uh, you know, it's always about giving everything to their clients, giving everything to their work and coming home and kind of not giving anything to themselves. And I think for me, um, you know, if, if, if I think, you know, if, you know, from the medical professionals that I've spoken to, one of the things that stands out is how important it is to, to leave something in the tank for ourselves um, and not to just give everything to our clients, because in the end, um, we're not going to have anything for ourselves. We're not going to have anything for our children, for our loved ones. And then in turn, we're going to break down and not, have, not be able to look after our clients. So actually, I think for me, um, you know, we talk about how hard it is to look after ourselves as caregivers because we look after others. But I think for me, that's going to be, you know, one of the things that certainly I've learned um, over the years. I mean, again, you know, I'm sharing, I had a heart attack two years ago and, and I've, I've had to learn to look after myself because if I don't look after myself then I can't look after anyone else and so I can't say that I um, you know learned this and I uh, kind of as a psychologist just you know learned to do this on my own I, I had to learn a lesson I had to go through an experience and you know no one wanted to I don't want to have a heart attack no one wants to have COVID but hopefully we can take something out of it we can take something we can learn something from this and and certainly one of the things that I learned through going through a, you know, a, a, a physically um, traumatic experience like a heart attack was that I have to look after myself. I have to slow down. And, and maybe this is what COVID is doing for us is, is to say, listen, of course, there's financial concerns and of course, there's stresses of the world, but we really need to um, prioritize ourselves sometimes. Absolutely. Yes. I think that yes. the balance yes. side of things that, that you're mentioning there is, is imperative. We also don't want to run the risk of um, operating with compassion fatigue, you know, which is caregiver burnout. 
we want to, as I said, like we, we have the privilege to be of service. And I think that's incredible. And that means we have to look after ourselves in order to do that with effectiveness. So it's to know yourself, to, to regulate your own emotions, to find that balance between, you know, treating your body well with putting good food in, with exercising, making sure that you have the, the access to outlets of your own creativity, all of those good things that create balance and restore your tank and fill up that tank because it's such a missed opportunity to go through these these really scary and harrowing experiences without learning something about ourselves and changing and tweaking the things that need attention so that we can have more meaning in our lives. Okay, um, great. So we, in the last few minutes of this, um, officially this webinar would now be over, but I am gonna let it run till half past and end it at half past. Um, so, so what I thought to do is um, I can see the participants here and I've, I've lowered the couple of hands that were up from before. And if I could just ask any doctors who would like to share anything or ask anything to the psychologist or share anything personal, but the other people who have had COVID as well to just raise your hands. There should be a, a Dan's yeah, around. You can tell, I think there's a, you know, there's a little thing next to your name or at the bottom of the screen that says you can raise a virtual hand and then we'll promote you to the panel and you can just go ahead. So let's just see, is there anyone, you can do it now. Um, I do know someone who have just, yeah, okay. So we have, we have Kwasi at the top. Um, Dan, are you able to promote Kwasi to the, to the panel? Yeah, and Angela and Olivia. Okay, great. So there we have it. I don't think we'll get through more than that. So go ahead. Let's just, yeah, we'll try to keep them brief and so we can get through you guys. Okay. In that order. Um, my, my name is Kosi Letlape. Uh, I can't get my video to go on. Uh, I, I'm the president of the Health Professions Council. And what I just wanted, and the chair of the Medical and Dental Board, what I just wanted to share was that uh, I tried to introduce a, 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 a recommended medical for those on our register once a year that they have a checkup. And you'll be amazed that it was resisted by doctors. They recommend checkups for other people, but they don't want checkups for themselves. And, and I was saying, when we start, it would not be an issue that we police vigorously. It'll just be a tick box that says, you've had it. We don't want to know the details. We just need to know that you don't think you're superwoman or superman that what you recommend for others, you recommend for yourself. And the profession refused. I even tried to introduce that at the summer conference of a year ago. Yeah. And, that, and, and the doctors were not interested. And that's what we have to contend with. And I hope from this COVID experience, people will be more open to the fact that if we're going to be good to other people, why can't we be good to ourselves? That's what I just wanted to share. And thank you for sharing your stories and it will inform what we do from the regulatory side. And in terms of uh, telehealth, we will be looking, we are looking at regulations to ensure that we encourage that. Because not only would it be better for the doctors, it also means we can increase our capacity and be available for more patients. And even though we don't have the numbers, we could be taking care of more people if you use the advantage of technology. Thank you. You're muted, Dan. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's exactly what's, what's uh, on point to what our psychologists have said. And I mean, I, I think that's like as important as CPD maybe should be like personal looking after the points, not, not more than ethics, maybe. That's, that's just a thought. Okay, <laughs> moving forward to Angela. Where, would you like to unmute yourself and, and, and share? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Um, so thanks to Karen for asking me to um, share my story. Um, so I had a quite a different circuitous route um, to catching this. My husband's also an anesthetist um, and I elected to stop working at the beginning of COVID because at the beginning of the year, 
I'd moved in with my parents. My mom had just uh, been diagnosed with breast cancer. She had to have a bilateral mastectomy um, about a week before lockdown. And my dad has got um, MS, so he's unable to look after her. And given you know what we knew about the disease, the decision was to move our um, wonderful helpers out and I would move in and I would look after my parents. I also have four children. So we would all move in together and I would be it. So um, as we tend to do as doctors, um, I approach this with a lot of vigor and enthusiasm and I can completely understand the paranoid spraying of everything known to mankind because I was looking after my mom and my dad and I was gonna spray everything in the house that could be sprayed, that could possibly make anybody sick. So my husband would arrive back from work. He would literally, um, in front of my mother, have to strip down to his underpants at the door. Everything would go in the washing machine. Um, or if he'd go for a shower, I would wash that. I sprayed everything. I think I've said six times, I sprayed everything. I, did, I was the only person who did the shopping, I did everything. Anyway. Eventually online schooling resumes and I, for the first time in my life, realized I'm not going to be able to look after all four children and two parents um, and online school. So I'm gonna to have to call one helper back. So I kindly ask her to return. I test her before she starts and off we go. A few days later, my eight year old who, I mean, he's eight, he's never had an antibiotic in his life. He's, he's a third child. He's a typical third child. He's a, he's a thug, he's an oaf. He starts complaining of photophobia and a bit of cotches a bit and like he's really clapped out, which is really completely new behavior. And we had not seen a single soul other than my husband going to work. I had, I mean, we had obeyed every rule. I had fought with my parents on a daily basis about never leaving the house. I mean, we really, when I say I was a control freak about it and ticked every box, I really did. So anyway, he goes down and after a day of this, I say, okay, um, sorry to say, but this definitely looks uh, COVID-like. So off he goes for a test and so does my husband, both come back positive. My first thought was, oh my Lord, my husband's gonna kill my mother. And it wasn't the first time I would have thought he would have done that, but I just didn't picture it to be COVID. So, <laughs> okay. so Oh, oh, oh my God, oh my God. That's all I could just keep thinking was, oh my God, okay, it's fine. It's fine, it's gonna be fine. Then I think, Philip, we better test the rest of the family. So pray like how my parents come back as negative, which they do, but our help is positive. My two-year-old was positive and my 10-year-old was positive. So that left the 12-year-old and me as negative. Anyway, I'm now still dealing with, you know, clapped out mother, um, immobile father, and now, half dead age or old so I'm not really focused on all of what's going on anyway everyone like evolves out of COVID everyone stays negative and I'm just like well I'm just I mean my parents stay negative I started feeling so unwell I thought I'm sure it's just the stress you know tummy bug or whatever it is I tested negative so I retest and now surprisingly I'm positive but you know I'm going to be so hardcore because I am the ruler of the roost and everything is going to be fine and I have to make this work so this insidious progression of symptoms, I, I really didn't read. I, to cut an extremely long story short, I had a, a weird neurological manifestation. I, I, over three weeks, completely lost the use of my right hand. You know, you hear about COVID toes. I mean, we called it Dumbledore's hand in, in our house. My hand went like purple. It didn't work at all. I started dragging my right foot. My speech was a bit slurred. This is all retrospective. I couldn't hear well out of my right ear. Um, you know, I assist um, at a job and um, I, my binocular vision was gone. And then people were like sending me messages saying, are you okay, you haven't responded. And I had no recollection what they were talking about. I completely lost my short-term memory. I'd find I was standing in the shop. Um, I wouldn't know where I, where I was, how I got there. Um, I knew I had a list in front of me that I had to shop and now I'm like wandering around like some kind of psychopath with this like purple hand that I now start sticking in my pockets of my, of my bomber jacket because I'm always freezing. So that adds to the psychopathic look of like the one hand in the pocket thing and the quickly look so confused. And all through this, I absolutely hid it from everybody that I could possibly hide it from because there was no way there was space in our home for me to be sick.
Uh, they're very anxious. One of my children are very, in fact, two of my children are very anxious. And if I'd had to have gone into hospital, it would have signaled the collapse of life as we know it. Um, and retrospectively, it was extremely, extremely irresponsible of me. I'm only now sort of recovering some neurological function. And um, I look back now and I think about all the hours in my life that I've spent looking after so many people and how many times I judged them. And um, particularly when we were younger and we were like interns or com service people and this mother would bring in this crap to our child and you're like, how did you leave it so long? I mean, when I eventually arrived at the neurologist, he was like, you are a knob. You have waited so long, you're an absolute idiot. And it actually took somebody turning around and saying it to me in such definitive words for me to realize that all these years of telling people what to do and making judgments on the way they looked after themselves all boiled down to the most horrible self-reflection that we spend so long caring about everybody else. And we have often no clue what's going on with us at all. And I, I mean, when Karen and I spoke about this before, I've labeled this to my patients, to the people I work with as a Toyota virus. Toyota makes every single kind of vehicle that you can think of, and those vehicles can do anything. And this virus can do anything. It looks like anything. It manifests differently in everybody else. And it has really opened my eyes less to sympathy of how people feel, but more to a concept of how not to judge other people who don't look after themselves. So that's really all I have to say about that. Thank you, Angela. Okay, so I'm gonna ask Dave to respond and then I'm gonna ask the last person sharing to go straight after Dave, just so we can put, put time. Sure, sure. I think for me, what really stands out is, um, and I think it's not only doctors and I think, also, we read about this so much, and I think it actually becomes a bit of a cliche sometimes, and, uh, and, and I know I get irritated by it, but, but we hear this thing about being mindful, you know, this idea of, and what is being mindful really? It's, you know, for me, it's really just about stopping for a while, and, you know, if I'm, you know, in the past seeing seven, eight, what, you know, for psychologists, that's a lot of people in a day, <laughs> not for a GP. But for, and, and actually not stopping and actually taking time to think, how am I doing? To actually think, how's my body doing? Um, and I think that's the point is that as, as um, you know, as, as Angela, as you were saying, you know, we're so good at telling everyone else what to do and, and, and being aware of other people, but we don't actually stop for ourselves and think, how am I doing? And, 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 and I think for me, <laughs> my wife always jokes it, you know, jokes with me and says how out of touch I am with my body for a psychologist. Like, you know, I don't actually, I'm not aware of myself. And I think that's so profound. She enjoys, it's, it's funny, I'm hearing that doctors are married to doctors and, I, and doc, psychologists seem to marry psychologists. I don't know what, we can do another whole show on that. But I think the bottom <laughs> line is, the whole, the, whole, the whole line is that, you know, the important thing is for us to also be mindful. Um, and and actually, you know, I joke also about psychologists not asking people, we're always asking how other people are. And it's the same thing with GPs. How are you doing? Instead of actually um, making sure that you're asking yourself and making the time and the space, and that requires quietness, and that requires sitting and slowing down and saying, how am I actually feeling to be more in touch with ourselves? And then if we are more in touch with ourselves, then we're not going to leave things so long. And then we're not going to abuse ourselves. And, and hopefully look after ourselves. And then, and I know I've said this a lot tonight, then we're gonna be able to look after, if we look after ourselves, then we're gonna look after our families, and then we're even gonna be better doctors and better professionals. So, so I think for me, the key tonight is, you know, and, and again, I'll quickly, cause I know we're running out of time. I thought I made it up, but I keep reading it in books where, you know, you go into a plane and they always say, you know, put the mask on yourself, before, you know, if there's decompressurization. And, and I think for me, it's so important as, as caregivers and helpers that we put the masks on ourselves, we be mindful of ourselves, and then we're going to be in great positions to look after our clients, our patients, and, our, and, and, and be there for our loved ones around us. Thank you. I think Olivia actually has, has dropped off, but if I'm correct, I don't think she wants to ask still. If you do, do you want to just raise your hand? That's what Dan Stillman said. Okay, in which case, can I ask Peter to give your closing words and then we can finish off? Sure. So 
before I give my, my closing word, I just also want to extend my gratitude to every single one of you um, that have l literally stepped forward and are fighting this fight and helping all of us and keeping all of us safe. And um, Dan, to you for providing such a safe space for everybody to come and share these experiences. It's a very big deal. And I think you're an unbelievable resource to a hell of a lot of people. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, I hope that tonight, the, the biggest word I think that, that keeps flashing in my head is resources, resources, resources. Because I think that if we can extend those resources, we can develop better health for ourselves. So reach out to each other, check in with each other as colleagues extend i'm sure you already are doing that just by these webinars and these meetings right that's why they've been so successful and there's obviously a need to keep checking in check in with certain family members allow yourselves to perhaps speak to each other about things other than what's going on with COVID. you know perhaps their, their hobbies and things like that you can start engaging in to start filling up those tanks develop the different understanding of this resilience um, and, and try and move away from that compassion fatigue that I've seen develop a hell of a lot, you know, where people are starting to feel depressed by the thought of being of service, where people, the fatigue isn't, you know, necessarily from COVID, it's the, the, the mental exhaustion and then the physical exhaustion that comes and appears. And just know yourself, start to practice a little bit of these things that David was mentioning, the mindfulness, just to take a moment and see who are you now since COVID hit the world in your experiences, in your relationships, in your family dynamics? I think it would be a really missed opportunity to take that time to reflect and see anything you want to change and implement. But the, the, the main thing is utilize resources, see what's out there. So much is available in terms of books, webinars, colleagues, information, and I just want to thank you all so much for all of your time and all of your effort um, helping all of us stay safe and I'm wishing all of you guys an abundance of health moving forward. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much to David and to Peter for, for really being being here to listen to all of these stories and I'm so, it's really been great to learn from you guys. I, I just feel like your EQ and your insight is, is, is incredible. It's very inspirational certainly to me. And thank you to all the doctors who shared tonight. Um, I know it's run over time and I'm sorry about that, but we will have a few weeks break now. I know we've, I think everybody's been webinared out a little bit, like not from these necessarily, but every second night there's a webinar uh, from some organization or something. But um, I think this was an important one because we, we, as you rightly say, put on the mask on ourselves first. And I'm not sure that we're always doing that. So um, thank you so much, everybody. Um, doctors on here who would like to join, you know, especially for GPs who'd like to join the GP group, please um, just send an email or WhatsApp. We do have a mail list now from these, these webinars and when we organize the next project or endeavor, we will definitely email you. Um, and thank you all so much for taking part. Really, it was really, really wonderful. And um, yeah, looking forward to sharing um, information going forward. I really feel as though being emotional and just, you know, academic supports for one another, we can now, you know, really grow after COVID far beyond COVID because COVID will end, but then there'll be much more opportunity for us to work as a, as a team of doctors across South Africa. And that's been a big, big part of the well, birth positive of this pandemic. So thank you everyone. Have a good night. And uh, hopefully Richard Friedland's stats will get better and better. And thanks also to again, they're not here at the moment. I told them at the beginning of that, I don't have to stay for all of this deep, emotional part but um to louis and to prof shub for for sharing their knowledge with us have a good night oh one more thing sorry is to a huge thank you to dan stillerman and the excel academy as always i did thank him at the beginning but again because once again he stayed on here for hours and hours um coordinating this doing this um i've done a few on my own and they're always better when he's around and um, him and Avi from, from the Excel Academy, and we, we really, really deeply appreciate it. And we're looking for the opportunity to thank you guys in the most appropriate way when it presents. But thank you so much, Dan and, and Avi.
Pleasure. Thanks, Dan. Thanks uh, to the panelists. And yeah, I mean, I learned a lot from here as well. Maybe we should leave the chat open for the next half a minute, a minute. There's so many wonderful comments coming through so people can have their word in the chat. And uh, yeah, have a good night and stay safe, everybody. Okay. We, we'll try and synthesize the questions into a list. So I'm sure that when I give that to Karen and the editors on the Voices that care group, they'll soon be able to turn that into something. So I know there are a lot of unanswered questions, but we also have that from last time. We will try and put that into something soon. Have a good night, everyone.